deep within the jungle. We're talking about a civilization discovered in the middle of a rainforest. Cryptic remains of a lost civilization, one that spanned a continent for more than a thousand years. They definitely had attributes of the supernatural. They were the ancient Maya. Their rulers filled vast cities with sky-high pyramids, ornate palaces, and lavish plazas. They were masters of their environment. They were very resourceful in figuring out how to harness the energy, creating amazingly sophisticated works of art and engineering, and sustaining a civilization for 1,500 years. Then, after generations of prosperity and innovation, the ancient civilization collapsed, turning bustling cities into ghost towns to be reclaimed by Mother Nature. Centuries later, answers to the mystery surrounding these majestic people and the godlike kings who ruled them tell a story of conquest, ingenuity, and disaster. In 869 AD, in the lowlands of the Guatemalan jungle, the Maya are becoming desperate. Food and clean water are dwindling. Thousands of people are starving. And malnutrition and disease are ravaging the population. The Maya no longer trust their divine rulers to appease their gods. Political turmoil plagues the kingdoms, and one by one, the great city-states are being abandoned the ancient Maya civilization is crumbling. City after city, area after area begins to fail. Cities are abandoned, kings disappear, um, and what had been classic Maya culture really comes to an end. What happened to this great people? Even today, scholars are still mystified. We know that people began to disappear. The question is, how did that happen? The answer may lie in complex hieroglyphics known as the Maya Code. A hieroglyph is a complex way of uh, conveying all the information that Maya people could think or express. And it's the only example in the Americas of a complete, complex system of writing. Today, these cryptic symbols reveal a history of brutal warfare, larger-than-life rulers, and the rise and fall of an enigmatic people. Hi, I'm Peter Weller, and I'm standing on top of this beautiful temple deep in the rainforest of southern Mexico near the border of Guatemala, and this is the heart of the civilization of the ancient Maya. For years, archaeologists believed that the ancient Maya were peacefully separated into 40 or so independent city-states, each with their own dynasty of kings. For what we could tell, there seemed to be trade, communication, but there didn't seem to be any particular imperial aggression motivated by a thirst for land or power outside of a king's own territory. But in the last half century, these theories are starting to fly in the face of a different story because hieroglyphs like this one, the remnants of the ancient Maya's advanced writing system, are painting a whole new picture. The touchy-feely 1960s and new age ideas of a gentle and loving people are being fast replaced by a much more complex reality of city-states butting heads in bloody clashes. And now we have evidence that brutal battles and human sacrifice were fundamental components of life among the ancient Maya. But the evolution of the Maya civilization into this complex network of city-states didn't happen overnight. The Maya came into existence probably a couple of thousand years before Christ. By 500 BC, population was on the rise, and small communities were turning into the first major Maya sites located throughout Central America. Fully organized kingdoms were ruling the region by 250 AD, with mighty rulers at the helm. They had um, powerful rulers. They were in competition with each other, and sometimes this competition led to war. For the Maya, it was war led by kings in the name of the gods. Maya kings were people like us, but for the Maya, they definitely had attributes of the supernatural. The price of devotion had brutal and sometimes deadly consequences. 
people owed a blood debt to the gods. It wasn't that they didn't regard human life or human blood highly, quite the contrary. Human blood and human life was the most precious, the most sacred thing that could be offered to the gods in order to repay the blood debt that was incurred at creation. Bloodletting and human sacrifice dominated the king's strategic thinking. They picked allies and attacked neighbors, all with an eye on appeasing their deities and staying autonomous. Unlike Rome, in the case of the Maya, we're not dealing with one empire. Instead, we're dealing with a series of rival kingdoms. By the third century AD, Maya civilization was flourishing. No one city ever succeeded in dominating all the others, but one seat of power was on the rise. Its name was Tikal. Tikal is one of the few cities that goes strong in the pre-classic period before the time of Christ and then it just continues pretty much unabated all the way until the end of the classic period. This is a city that never really lost it. But in the sixth century, a rival power named Kalakmul threatened Tikal's success. The Maya had these two great dynastic capitals, Kalakmul and Tikal. Those two cities essentially locked horns. It's really Kalakmul that seems to engage in this action in which they engineer alliances all the way around Tikal, essentially boxing in their enemy. It would be up to an ambitious and visionary leader to build a center of military power, one that would take on Kalakmul. His name was Yikin Khan Kawil. He would construct one of the most iconic structures of the Maya, a pyramid that would stand the test of time, the temple of the giant jaguar. The most valuable monument was one that took a lot of effort. So a big temple pyramid is an indication of your power, your strength, your prestige. It's a way of drawing people into your city because it shows what an awesome, powerful ruler you are. Building in semi-tropical environments with rudimentary materials was a unique challenge, especially when the goal was to build vertically using Stone Age technology. Most of the technology that we associate with big stone constructions were unknown to the Maya. They did not have beasts of burden. They didn't have metal tools. What the Maya did have was a virtually unlimited supply of malleable limestone and a great deal of manpower. Your labor was one of the things that you were required to give to the king on an annual basis. Blocks of limestone were quarried and then pushed, pulled, or carried by sheer force to the construction site. They used something that we call the tump line, and this is a rope that would pass around the forehead, and in that, they could carry, literally at times, hundreds of pounds of debris. Level by level, the pyramid was built skyward. Wooden scaffolding supported the laborers and the structure as it expanded. Skilled masons shaped the limestone with stone tools and wooden mallets. Though the interior was filled with unrefined rubble, the exterior was deceivingly manicured covered in a strong mortar known as Maya stucco and painted red. Even though they knew of the wheel, even though they knew of metal, they elected not to make practical use of either of these things. And I think in part, it was because in their worldview, something was much more valuable if a lot of human labor went into it. At nearly 150 feet, the temple of the giant jaguar emerged facing west toward the setting sun. The ancient skyscraper would command the attention of all who set foot in Tikal's Grand Plaza as a symbol of power and redemption. But Yikin Khan Kawil's engineering marvel was just the beginning. In 736, Kawil had defeated his ultimate rival, Kalak Mool. Then, in 743 and 744, he attacked and eviscerated two critical Kalakmul allies that surrounded Tikal, El Peru to the west and Naranjo to the east. Finally, the suffocating noose that had once strangled Tikal was broken. 
in celebration of this, he builds a, a whole series of, of long, major expansions to the palace, uh, new pyramids. And when we look at Tikal today, in many cases, we're looking at the fruits of that success. He may have even launched the construction of the tallest of Tikal's structures, Temple 4. Made of 250,000 cubic yards of stone, the massive pyramid stretched more than 210 feet, or 22 stories high, nearly as tall as the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge. It jutted far above the dense rainforest canopy, with a 180-degree view of the city. In the distance, other Maya cities were also ambitiously building toward the sky. But at this moment, with King Yakin Khan Kawil at the helm, Tikal was the unchallenged powerhouse of the Maya civilization. But Tikal was not alone. Out of sight, about 250 miles to the west, another dynasty is forging the construction of a great Acropolis. There, in the seventh century, a king with a vision would emerge. He would turn one of the wettest cities in the world into a mecca of New World architecture. The view from the top of Temple 4 at Tikal was the backdrop for the Masasi temples in the movie Star Wars. 611 AD, on the outskirts of the Maya world in southeast Mexico, a city by the name of Palenque is on the ropes. It launches a last-ditch defense against regional powerhouse Calakmul. Palenque's forces are overwhelmed, and the king is killed with no male heir to the throne. Because Maya kings were thought to be divine lords, their lineage is key to survival. The end of a dynasty usually spelled disaster. Yet at this critical moment, one of the greatest building campaigns in Maya history was about to begin in Palenque, and the king behind it would remain unknown until the middle of the 20th century. In 1949, some of the questions regarding the mysterious dynasty of Palenque are answered when archaeologist Alberto Ruz Lulle is excavating this 75-foot high temple, now called the Temple of the Inscriptions. Now, I'm in pretty good shape, but those guys had headdresses and big robes, obsidian knives and swords. I thought I'm in pretty good shape, for an old guy anyway. But I don't know how they did it. And I don't know how Alberto Rousselier did it. But I still got a lot to go. And when he gets up into the sanctuary, he looks around. And he notices on the floor a row of holes covered with stone stoppers. And he figures out that these holes were made for ropes in order to pull up the slab, just like I'm on a trapdoor. So he pulls up the slab, this one exactly, and he follows a steep staircase filled with dirt and debris. He's never seen a Maya pyramid like this before. So his men start digging and digging and digging into the unknown. The wet stairs are very slippery from the moisture and time and the rain from the forest, and he finally gets down to a plateau. And he notices that the whole pathway doubles back and then continues, and he finds hidden doors, secret passageways, signs that a lot of thought and calculation went into building this structure. Finally, after three years, after three long years, he gets to the bottom of this 80-foot stairway, and there he sees a small corridor. And in the corridor is a stone box, and in the box are six skeletons, the remains of souls who were sacrificed to protect the person for whom this temple was built. But he still doesn't know who that person was. And then he finally sees a huge door, a massive triangular stone. So his men and he open it, and then they go in. 
and behind this huge triangular door is a vaulted crypt about 30 feet long and 23 feet high. And inside the crypt is this massive sarcophagus carved from one piece of limestone. And on top of this sarcophagus is this magnificent lid with these expertly carved images of a king. Along this edge, by the way, which is covered with cinnabar, this red stuff, is poison to the touch to keep looters from coming in here and ruining it. And by the way, if the ancient Egyptians might have used this, we might have had more antiquities coming out of that country today. But along this edge is the image of a shield. And up in the sanctuary is another image of a shield. And the ancient Maya word for shield is pakal. So Alberto Rus had discovered the tomb of the most important Maya king, Pakal the Great. Pakal's ascension to the throne in 615 AD came during the most critical time for Palenque. With no direct heir, the elders of Palenque had turned to an outsider, a royal who lived outside the kingdom named Lady Sakkuk. Now she returned to Palenque with her adolescent son, Pakal. The future of Palenque hung in the balance as the young boy was crowned king by his mother. He was just 12 years old. She sort of kept the throne warm for him for over 10 years while he was growing up. As the young king grew into adulthood, Pakal had to deify himself to legitimize his rule. He declared his mother to be the living embodiment of the first mother who created humans and the gods. He then was the son of a goddess, an exalted position that removed any question of his legitimacy. He was almost certainly a charismatic fellow. He had to have been. He had no power base. He had to do it almost on pure charisma and determination. As a Johnny-come-lately, as someone who needs to prove himself, he's going to be as splashy as possible. And so he constructs the most gaudy buildings imaginable. He is establishing all sorts of new architectural patterns. To authenticate his lineage, Pakal set off on a building spree to revitalize his battered kingdom. One of his first orders of business, the renovation and expansion of the royal palace, an impressive structure that sits in the heart of the main plaza. More than 70,000 square feet, the palace would become a maze of galleries, chambers, stairways, courtyards, and tunnels, and was designed to reflect his ideas of grandeur. At first, Pakal's architects, like those throughout the Maya world, employed what is called the corbelled vault to support their soaring structures. Now, this was a, a pretty straightforward um, structure where uh, a series of lines of stones of ever-decreasing height are laid on top of each other. So it forms really a kind of inverted V-shape uh, with a row of capstones along the top. But the corbelled vault left something to be desired. This basic construction limited interior space and light and forced architects to build walls wider than even the space it enclosed. Driven by a determined king, Pakal's engineers now looked for solutions to this problem. What the Palenque designers succeeded in doing was lightening the weight. Um, they produced sort of honeycomb structures on the top of these buildings. They could make their spans wider area, more light could come in. These innovations reduced the stress on the load-bearing walls, creating a more open and inviting feel than the traditional Maya buildings. Over 60 years, Pakal's builders became the best in the new world. But it wasn't until the end of his rule that Pakal commissioned one of the most complex and imaginative projects ever attempted by the Maya, the Temple of the Inscriptions. The discovery of the Temple of the Inscriptions changed all our ideas about Maya pyramids. They weren't supposed to be uh, mortuary uh, shrines. Inside, along a stairway leading down to the tomb, engineers built a psychoduct, or hollow tube. It's a conduit that allows someone on the top of the pyramid to speak into this speaking tube, and eventually you would be able to presumably communicate directly with uh, Pakal in his tomb. This 20-ton sarcophagus was built to last an eternity. 
This actually had a lid which was rolled off to one side and there was a cavity for his body to be put so that when he eventually did die, the door was sealed and the stairway was blocked. His architects and sculptors designed a coffin rich in symbolism, portraying the resurrection of Pakal in the afterworld. Royal scribes were ordered to draw a grid to accommodate 640 glyphs that would tell the story of Pakal's reign. Many Maya pyramids don't leave much textual record on them. The opposite is the case in the temple, the inscriptions. Everything about it, from these huge tablets on the summit to the information inside, proclaims that this is the final resting place of the founder of one of the great Maya dynasties. In 683, during Pakal's 68th year as king, the 12-year-old boy who grew to be one of the great Maya rulers died at the age of 80. He was covered in red cinnabar and adorned in lavish jewelry. A jade mask was placed over his face. Though the legacy of Pakal the Great would be hard to match, his son had been waiting on the sidelines for nearly 50 years. With the clock ticking, he would launch a series of building projects harnessing the laws of physics and Mother Nature. In 1985, Pakal's burial mask was stolen from a museum in Mexico. Fortunately, four years later, the mask was recovered. 684 AD. The mighty King Pakal has engineered Palenque to be one of the finest Maya capitals ever known. After 68 years on the throne, his body is buried in a tomb that rivals those built for the Egyptian pharaohs. Now it is up to his son to build upon his father's legacy and cement his own reign. His name was Khan Balam. Pakal was the founder of a dynasty, but his son was a great consolidator. He was someone that was going to make sure that that dynasty would continue. The 48-year-old king immediately threw himself into an ambitious three-pyramid complex that would stand as his own monument for the ages. He designed and constructed uh, the cross group, uh, one of the most intricate and beautiful groups of ceremonial temples ever constructed in the Maya world. These are his memorial, and they tower above the palace. They look down on the works of his father. And in some ways, I think they represent a statement of individuality that he himself is going to leave his imprint on the city just as his father did. He ordered his engineers to build three intricate structures, the Temple of the Cross, the Temple of the Foliated Cross, and the Temple of the Sun. Khan Balam's engineers would take a giant leap forward, using sophisticated geometric calculations unsurpassed anywhere in the world based on the Maya's creation of a complete number system. One of the many ways in which the Maya were ahead of their time was in their creation of what we would refer to as zero. With a similar combination of a, of a shell the, which represented zero or completion, and then a dot, a number one, and then a five, by just you know, placing them in different positions, they were able to multiply you know, uh, and reach incredible numbers. The uh, Greeks and Romans were tremendous engineers, uh, theologians, historians, and so forth, but were very limited by their mathematical system because they didn't have a zero. So here you have the irony that they were able to gr produce great public works, philosophy, and whatnot, but were really pretty lousy mathematicians compared to the Maya. Khan Balam's engineers advanced mathematical observations may have included the discovery of proportions like the square roots of rectangles and something called the golden mean, a naturally occurring proportion that can be seen in animals, nature, and even the human body as 1 to 1.618. Measure a person from his head to his belly button and then from his belly button to his feet, you get a proportion 
very close to 1 to 1.618, the golden mean. Some scholars believe this proportion has been appearing in structures for thousands of years at places like the pyramids of Giza in Egypt and the Parthenon in Greece. Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man is a study of this proportion, and some even say he painted the Mona Lisa using this ratio in her features. With nothing more than some sticks and a cord, Khan Balam's engineers may have been able to measure the square roots of rectangles. In the Temple of the Cross, these shapes would be used to mark the two main piers of the facade, the width of the medial doorway and the interior walls. The golden ratio can be seen in the rear chambers and the base of the structure with the side wall as one and the back wall as 1.618. By using repeated squares and natural proportions in the Temple of the Cross, a beautifully calculated floor plan took shape, full of geometry, mythological history, and a king's own legacy. But not all engineering in Palenque was done with an eye on the afterlife. Palenque's engineers also had to focus on more practical needs. One of the names of Palenque is La Camja, which means place of great waters. Um, we have four rivers running through Planque year-round. We have dozens of springs. We have water everywhere. These riches came with challenges. Palenque was surrounded by steep hills, natural springs and creeks that carved their way through the base of the site, leaving only bits and pieces of flat, water-free land for building. Unlike most Maya cities, the problem facing Palenque wasn't how to store water for the dry season, it was how to deal with an overabundance of water. As you can see, everything is green here, it rains every day. So to meet this challenge, the city planners devised a unique way of diverting the pre-existing streams by building subterranean aqueducts that would channel the water underground, thus saving more land on top for cultivation. These tunnels were lined with limestone and they were covered with our old friend from Egypt and Greece, the Corbeld Vault. Series of protruding stones, one on top of the other, formed sort of an arch overhead. Now these ceilings were so sturdy, they could support the massive weight of Palenque's giant plazas overhead. So the people were walking along with the water rushing underneath them, being diverted away from the city, just like it is where I live today in New York City. What's even more impressive is that there are signs that Maya engineers may have figured out a way to create water pressure. They built water tunnels that ran through the rugged terrain into the city, often directed uphill. As they got closer to the main structures, the pipes got incrementally smaller. Like Roman fountains, the water pressure gained momentum as it coursed through increasingly narrower tunnels eventually allowing for running water throughout Palenque's buildings. We have beautiful systems of, of sweat baths and swimming pools and aqueduct. In its day, it would have rivaled any of the Roman aqueduct systems. We don't see this use of, of water pressure anywhere else, and it doesn't appear again until the Spanish bring the technologies with them. Together, Khan Balam and his father Pakal ruled Palenque for nearly 100 years, pushing Maya engineering to a level never seen before. The future seemed bright for this city on the rise, but its years of glory are about to come to a sudden end. Something is happening in the Maya world that will cause the classic city-states to implode. The Maya had developed the concept of zero by the fourth century AD, but the Europeans wouldn't understand the concept until 800 years later. By the eighth century, Palenque, Tikal, and the other kingdoms of the Maya world were expanding across the continent. Tall pyramids, unparalleled city planning, and sumptuous royal palaces advertised the glory of the great kings. Then, suddenly, these cities began to unravel, one after another. Royal sculptors stopped carving their monuments with historical information, and kings halted their construction projects. Maya civilization had plunged into darkness. 
fact, it's not that the entire Maya lowlands is abandoned overnight. It's that, you know, one kingdom falls here and another one 10 years later falls over here, then another one over here. The causes of the Maya collapse remains a great debate among scholars. We were really talking about a society that was pushing itself to the limits. There is no one single explanation for this implosion, but scholars seem to believe that environmental catastrophe led to a full-blown meltdown for the Maya civilization. The soil no longer produced crops, thus lack of food and polluted water produced malnutrition and disease. The Maya could no longer count on their kings to intercede with their gods because their great society was in a death spiral, and their kings, so long counted on for guidance and prosperity, were powerless to stop it. So sadly, but slowly and surely, the people voted with their feet, and the ancient Maya left their beautiful cities forever. There were no signs of mass graves. They did not vanish. Where did the millions of Maya go? If you wanted to go where it was happening, you moved north. Go, go north, young man. The cities that die in the south, and that's the only way to describe it, is they just go into oblivion, are never really replaced. But there are locations all around the Yucatan Peninsula where the cities not only thrive, but they begin to grow explosively. This growth was enhanced by an elaborate network of causeways called sacbays, or white roads. The sacbays weren't just local transport. They were emblems of the great political power of two allied cities that had the wherewithal to create this magnificent royal procession way between their two kingdoms. As much as 60 miles long in some places, they were a marvel of engineering. They would place huge rocks on both sides of the causeway and then filling whatever was in between with cobbles and unfinished rocks and stones. And then they cover all this surface with stucco, nice plaster, and then upon it, they created this smooth surface. In the Yucatan Peninsula, the sock bays often charted a course through the rough terrain in perfectly straight lines. It's not easy to cut a line 60 miles that doesn't deviate even a, even a degree. I would really like to know uh, what instruments they use. We have no record of it. These causeway systems allowed for rebirth, movement, and trade in the north. And it is there that the ragged survivors of the southern lowlands hope to find a second chance in a Yucatan city called Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza came to be the largest and most powerful city from about 800 to 1050 or so that had a real knack of being a big tent. So it was a very cosmopolitan place, and I'm sure it traded handsomely on that reputation. One of the buildings unique to the site was El Caracol, an astronomical observatory. The Maya were obsessed with both time and the stars and spent centuries looking to the sky for answers. The Maya probably had something called a gnomon, which is uh, a series of two crossed bars. And by looking at the intersection of those two bars, they would be able to focus on something. With just basic tools, the Maya were able to track the movement of the stars and planets and the passing of time. Like Stonehenge, this was a place where people could make solar and lunar observations. The staircase in the front of the building faced 27.5 degrees northwest, out of line with other structures, but in almost perfect alignment with Venus's most northerly position in the sky. It was closely aligned with the celestial bodies and occurrences, such as the movement of Venus and the solstices. In the higher tower of the building, three openings survive today. They are small, narrow, and irregularly placed, but they align along astronomical sight lines. In the Caracol, we can see in its orientations, in its peculiar displacements, in its odd alignment of buildings, a focus on what Venus was doing at the time. Venus is a kind of variable uh, actor up there in the skies. Sometimes it moves in this direction, sometimes it moves in that direction. The Caracol seems to be about looking at Venus when it's come to the end of a certain kind of motion. 
This astute astronomical observation allowed the Maya to build their interlocking calendars that were more accurate than any other used in the ancient world. The Maya had two calendars, one ritual and then, you know, the, the solar calendar that is, that is very, very similar to what we use in the Western world. The Maya measured the solar year to be 365 days. Their measurements for the revolution of Venus and the occurrence of lunar eclipses were equally on target. In just 200 years, the Maya had achieved a rebirth in the wake of the catastrophic destruction of their southern cities. But now the North would face an even deadlier enemy, one that was capable of annihilating the Maya while leaving their cities intact. Chichen Itza is renowned for its well of sacrifice. It is said that humans and precious objects were tossed into the sinkhole as offerings to the rain god, Chuck. In the ninth century, the classic Maya city suddenly and mysteriously collapsed, ending the era of greatest prosperity and growth. Rebirth in the north gave the Maya an opportunity to combine astronomy and engineering on an unprecedented scale. At Chichen Itza, signs of continuing obsession with the skies left a permanent mark on Maya architecture. The cornerstone of Chichen Itza was the 98-foot El Castillo, or the castle, built in the 9th or 10th century. The 365 steps equal the number of days in the Maya civil calendar. 52 panels on each side represented the Maya's 52-year cycle. Nine terraced levels equaled the 18-month Maya solar calendar. And the temple's axis was perfectly aligned so that specific shadows were cast twice a year. For any Maya standing in, uh, and looking at the northwestern sector of the Castillo, they would see a balustrade and then a combination of shadows and the sun hitting that part just before sunset. And then several triangles form. And then at the very bottom of, the, of this balustrade, you have a nice carved serpent head, a snake coming down from heaven. And that is indicating the arrival of the rainy season. The Maya saw this phenomenon as a manifestation of the deity Kukul Khan, the feathered serpent. The Mayas were able to actually record you know, the equinox. That day in the year where night and day, you know, last the same. Every year, March 21st, you see the descent of Kukul Khan. Surrounding El Castillo, the civic buildings took on a new characteristic, spaciousness. With a broad open plaza, temples, marketplaces, a ball court, and colonnades. So the colonnade hall not only house uh, this, you know, the feasting events, but maybe individuals were brought into the plaza. You know, the general public was probably invited, depending on the occasions, to come to the plaza and witness the arrival of these, you know, uh, traders, uh, the merchants. Greek or Roman in appearance. These round columns were used as a new type of structural support and were an architectural first in the Maya world. The benefit of a column is that it allows you to create flat roofs. You're not investing all of your energy in creating stone buildings that are going to be containing corbel vaults, which may or may not collapse. The columns were simple in design. Round drums were placed one on top of the other, filled with rubble in between. A square section was placed at the top, and then flat rooftops made of stucco and wood were added to form expansive covered interiors. It involves people more openly in the life of, what, of the building and of what's happening within it than would have been possible with Maya pyramids of the full classic period. Those pyramids are mostly about exclusivity. It's about showing a space, holding it up high, but allowing very, very few people to look into it. The open column structures are much more inviting. But the welcoming atmosphere didn't last long. After more than 200 years of domination over the Yucatan, 
Chichen Itza suffered a fate similar to its neighbors in the south. It mysteriously collapsed. When the Spanish arrived on the shores of the Yucatan Peninsula in 1517, every large cosmopolitan center of the Maya world had been abandoned. Even so, a splintered Maya civilization, living in small villages across the countryside, put up a sustained fight against the conquistadors. They proved difficult to conquer because rather than taking a king captive or an emperor, as they did with the Aztec, they had to conquer one village at a time. And once they moved on to the next village, there'd be one behind them that would then uh, begin to rise in revolt. Maya warriors killed conquistadors by the thousands, but their weapons proved useless against a more potent enemy, disease. Within 100 years, 90% of the population of the New World was gone. The Maya who survived faced further persecution. Friar Diego de Landa had been sent from Spain to convert the Maya to Christianity, and he ruthlessly enforced his religious teachings. Diego de Landa was a young idealist who came to the New World trying to save souls, trying to win converts to what he referred to as the one true faith. But the Maya didn't believe that they should instantly and forevermore reject all of their own beliefs. On July 12, 1562, Landa ordered an auto de fe, or burning of the Maya texts, believing they were the writing of the devil. This was the end of thousands of years of accumulated knowledge of Maya civilization, one of the great tragedies in human history. In a lucky twist of fate, four codices survived the inferno and wear and tear of time. By the 19th century, some of these books that happened to escape the clutches of these friars and their destructive urges began to make their way into public attention. Today, their survival story is just another mystery in the complex history of the Maya. The fact that they were able to sustain an urban civilization in the rainforest for 1,500 years through all sorts of logistical and, and other challenges is one that we should admire and one from which we can stand to learn a great deal. Just as the Maya looked from the ground to the sky for guidance, we are now looking from the sky to the ground for answers. In recent years, NASA and the University of New Hampshire have been experimenting with remote sensing technology to see if they can determine where undiscovered cities might be hidden. Mounds of earth covered in trees that appear on readings may actually be ruins of ancient cities that have not been touched for centuries. More answers to the Maya mysteries may be right beneath our feet. My archaeology is just beginning. There are innumerable cities, innumerable temples, innumerable settlements that we have not been able to study and excavate. I think we're entering a golden age of my archaeology, and I can only see in the next century a time in which this will become one of the best understood civilizations of the ancient world. We now know that the Maya were an innovative and creative and majestic people with their own particular taste for violence. But what is the real allure of the Maya? What is this mystique that draws generation after generation the world over to this complex and sophisticated civilization? Is it the architecture with its serene palaces and temples or the intricacies of hieroglyphs and art in a complex writing system? Or is it the astounding comprehension of astronomy and mathematics with the concept of zero unparalleled in antiquity? Or is it simply because these remarkable people carved entire cities, not just villages and towns, but magnificent cities right out of some of the most inhospitable landscape in the entire world? In the rainforest between Honduras and the Yucatan, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of Maya sites that are untouched. In Palenque alone, there are 1,500 buildings that lie unexcavated, including temples larger than that one. And if you consider the archaeological treasures yet to be found in cities like Tikal and Chichen Itza, I say, and I'm sure I'm not alone, that the real allure of the Maya, the real magic and mystique of this civilization, are the mysteries that still lie buried.
deep within this jungle. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel. It was an empire that rose out of the ashes of barbarian conquest, straddled 15 time zones, and swallowed one-sixth of the entire world's landmass. The first thing to deal with is just this enormous size. Fueled by 400 years of chaos, the Russian Empire was forged by a lion's den of larger-than-life czars, whose tyrannical designs were as colossal as the country itself. She wrote to one of her correspondents, I can't stop myself from building. Building is like a disease. It's almost like alcoholism. These visionaries would drive Russia's rise to greatness, adapting foreign technologies to seize power, capture territory, and engineer an empire. But the same drive that fueled Russia's thirst for everlasting glory would ultimately devour its own people. Moscow. An up-and-coming Russian leader is making an unprecedented play for power. His name is Ivan III. For centuries, his people have been under the thumb of Eurasia's most brutal conquerors, a Mongol sect called the Tatars. But now, Ivan III would gamble everything to take them down. In one move, he tears up the pact, binding him to the Tatars, and declares Russia his. In the balance hangs the future of the Russian people. If Ivan loses, it means his life. If he wins, Russia will become the land of the Tsars. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. Some say the history of Russia is a history of its great cities. Now, what we think of as Russia today actually began in the ninth century, when a very diverse people started to coalesce around a single dominant clan called the Kievan Rus. The Kievan Rus were from the Ukraine, but they migrated here to a very forested area around many rivers and lakes and started a small trading hamlet called Novgorod, meaning new city. Oral tradition tells us that life in Novgorod was so chaotic and so tumultuous that the people actually invited a Viking warrior named Rurik from across the Baltic Sea to come here and establish order. In Novgorod, the Kievan Rus flourished. They borrowed the religion and building technology of their neighbors, the Byzantines, to build new cities and towns as the population spread. One of these outposts located in the fertile heart of Western Russia was called Moscow. Moscow, whose date of founding is officially given as 1147, was a small, uh, essentially log fort on a river by the name of Moscow, Moskva. As their cities developed, the Kievan Rus became known as Russians. But with no unified ruler or defenses, Russian cities were prime targets for invasion by the era's most aggressive conquerors, the Tatars. 1237, the Tatars charged across the Volga River with 120,000 riders. The early Russians were no match for this seasoned militia. For nearly 24 months, the Tatars devastated Russia. But for the rulers of Moscow, the invasion was an opportunity to buy favor with the invaders and rebuild better than before. Moscow's rise it started in the 14th century, very clever, cunning, ruthless politics on the part of the Grand Princes of Moscow, who managed to ingratiate themselves with the Tartar masters and achieve the ability to collect taxes from the other Russian principalities. Under the protection of the Tatars, Moscow began to bleed its Russian brothers dry, swallowing up neighboring territories to form a single Muscovite state. But its leaders were still forced to pay off their hated Tatar overlords. All that would change in 1462 with Ivan III. Ivan came to power determined to end Tatar domination of Russia. He takes the title Grand Prince of All Russia and begins to plot an overthrow of the Tatars. 
Ivan, I think, had all of the characteristics he needed to be a good and successful Tsar uh, and to earn the title the Great. He was ambitious, he was opportunistic, he was ruthless, he was smart. The new Tsar would hit the ground running. He marries into the empire that had given Russia its religion and architecture, Byzantium. With this alliance in place, Ivan adopts the Byzantine symbol of the two-headed eagle and declares Russia the third Rome. Then in 1472, he begins to lay down his engineering legacy. He commissions a new cathedral to be built as an unmistakable sign that Russia was now a force to be reckoned with. Workers began construction on the massive project in the early 1470s. But Mother Nature had other ideas. In 1474, a small tremor shook Moscow. Two years of construction on the mighty church collapsed into a pile of rubble. Built crudely of heavy stone on insufficient foundations, it was an accident waiting to happen. But Ivan would turn disaster into opportunity. At this point, Ivan III does what any shrewd ruler would do, find the best people. And the best people of that period, the 15th century, were in Italy. Ivan finds one Aristotle Fioravanti. Fioravanti was known as a skilled master architect throughout Italy. But before he could re-engineer Moscow's cathedral, he had to completely demolish the site. In the first of several innovations, Fioravanti uses siege technology in the form of a battering ram to raise the ruins of the church. And that amazed the Muscovites. What they had taken months to erect unsuccessfully, he was able to batter down in three weeks. Fioravanti then got to work building the cathedral. Today, we know it as the Cathedral of the Assumption. He began by using ancient Russian limestone churches as his model but infused the construction with Western building technology. The result revolutionized Russian architecture. We start with the foundation. Instead of the rubble-filled trench, which was typical of early medieval Russian building, he cleared the trench and put large oak pilings, which are much more stable means of supporting the building, so that the building doesn't later crack or deform in ways that will lead it to ultimately collapse. From there, Fiorvante's innovations expanded. Instead of using stacked pieces of limestone poorly mortared together, he arranges his limestone blocks in an interlocking bond to make them more stable. With his walls completed, he next turns to the delicate and dangerous operation of building the heavy vaulted ceilings. When you begin to vault the roof, there's an enormous amount of weight coming down on those walls. So the third element that he introduced was iron tie rods. Well, they were just iron rods that were inserted in the masonry and uh, extended across at the level of the vaulting. It uh, serves as an additional form of support. It ties the structure together. Last, instead of building the church's rounded cupolas and drums in heavy stone, he introduced the use of lighter and sturdier brick teaching his Russian builders how to fire and lay this new material. So that uh, from the pilings to the wall bonding, to the tie rods, to the upper structure, Fioravanti used a new set of techniques which had been mastered in Italy, but put them within the context of Russian symbols. The finished cathedral stood over 150 feet tall. It was a stunning and imposing edifice. With his symbol of power in place, Ivan was now ready to challenge the Tatars. Their response is quick. They raise a massive army and charge Moscow. Ivan raises his own force, and the two sides clash at the Ugra River, 300 miles west of Moscow. After months of standoff, the Russians finally overrun the Tatars. Ivan had successfully vanquished the oppressors who had subjugated the Russians for nearly three centuries. And with his legacy cemented in mighty monuments of brick and stone, 
Ivan III becomes Ivan the Great. By the time of his death in 1505, Ivan had created an independent Russia, but he had not yet created an empire. That distinction would belong to another Ivan, whose absolute authority and inhuman cruelty would earn him the title Ivan the Terrible. In 1472, Ivan III married Sophia Paleologus, the niece of the last emperor of Byzantium. Pope Paul II arranged their marriage. At the end of Ivan the Great's reign in 1505, he had freed the Russian people from subservience to the Tatars and tripled Moscow's territory. In other words, it went from 15,000 square miles to 45,000 square miles, which was an enormous accomplishment in itself, and that would earn him the title the Great. But the Tatars were still a problem. Although they had retreated from Moscow, their capital, Kazan, stood in the way of Russia's expansion east. It would take the dark determination of Ivan III's grandson to rid Russia of the Tatars and transform it into an empire. He would become known as Ivan the Terrible. I think the greatest single period of expansion was under um, Ivan uh, the Terrible. The Muscovite Tsardom encompassed the Volga, the Ural regions, and then eventually all of uh, Siberia. This great emperor would start out as a deeply troubled young man. Ivan's father died when he was a child, leaving him witness to a brutal struggle for power involving torture, execution, and murder. These atrocities would scar Ivan for life. Ivan the Terrible's traumatic background as a child, I think, produced uh, and Ivan, who was terrible, uh, even a, as a young child, he tortured animals. He seemed to be cruel and sadistic. By the time he came to power in 1547, he was convinced that he was personally anointed by God to rule Russia. He was the first Russian ruler to have himself crowned formally as Tsar. And Tsar is simply a Russian derivative of Caesar. It's an imperial title. As Tsar, Ivan found the perfect outlet for his fierce and ruthless intellect by launching Russia's first modern offensive called the Siege of Kazan. Ivan first created a new army of nearly 150,000 men, including artillery and engineering units trained in the latest siege tactics from Europe. His engineers adapted these foreign teachings to suit Russian warfare. In a first for Russian engineering, they designed a portable structure to defend Russian troops on Eurasia's exposed plains. It was called the Gulai Gorod. This was actually a movable fortress. Gulai Gorod consisted of wooden screens or wooden boards. These shields were assembled in varying patterns to defend infantry gunners called strelsi, the Russian word for shooter. Russian infantry stood inside these movable fortresses and used uh, guns, used cannons against the cavalry. And another way to use it was against the besieged city like Kazan. August 23, 1552, with his army assembled and equipped, Ivan begins fighting his way to Kazan. It was done very ingeniously as the Russians moved up and would very quickly erect prefabricated log fortresses as they inched ever closer to Kazan, in other words, tightening the noose around the city. Once entrenched outside the city, Ivan's troops unleashed a relentless assault rolling in 30-foot-high gulai garads to fire a barrage of artillery over the fortress walls. They killed many, many defenders in the streets of the city using these movable towers. But the fortress stood strong, so Ivan's generals ordered in a team of engineers to take a crack at the castle. They devise a daring plan to tunnel under the fortress walls, lay mines, and blow the fort wide open. On September 30th, they light a fuse that would decide the bloody fate of Kazan. 
The force of the explosion stops the battle in its tracks. That was the signal to the rest of the army, and all the regiments of the Tsarist army simultaneously started the assault of the fortress. After eight days of bloody battle, Kazan falls. Ivan was a conqueror, and Russia becomes an empire. This was a monumental feat uh, because the taking of Kazan uh, meant that uh, Russia was incorporating the former Tartar lands uh, to which she had been beholden. Uh, and Kazan opened the way for Russia to expand truly into an empire. It opened the way south to the Caspian and the Black Seas, and it opened the way east to Siberia. In 1555, to commemorate his victory, Ivan commissions a building that would become the most recognizable symbol of the Russian Empire. Today, it's known as St. Basil's Cathedral. The Cathedral of the Intercession, which we know as St. Basil's, is based on the technology of brick towers that the Italians brought in and the Russians later adapted to create votive tower churches. Constructed almost entirely of brick, the cathedral was actually eight churches in one. It was laid out in a geometric pattern, with each church circling a central tower, symbolizing the eight days of the siege of Kazan. In the 1580s, the cathedral's most distinctive feature was added. The onion dome takes its form, its image, from that flare that occurs at its base. It rests on a cylinder called a drum, and from that cylinder, the top of that cylinder, it flares out very sharply, rises up, and then culminates in a peak. That is the onion dome. The onion domes on St. Basil's were completely unique. Each one was constructed of individually textured, hand-painted metal sheaths laid over an iron frame. If you strip that metal sheath away, it would look something like a birdcage that had been squashed so that you got the flare. The result was a stunning architectural feat never before seen in Russia. By 1553, Ivan's dominions were the largest in Europe, and he was at the height of his power. But his deepening paranoia and iron grip on the jugular of the nation were slowly strangling his empire. He launched a series of costly and foolish wars and sadistically struck out at anyone who opposed his power. The flames of Ivan's insanity were consuming his own people. And no one was safe, not even his own family. Another reason Ivan uh, IV could be called the terrible is probably the finale of his reign uh, when he murdered his son, who was trying to protect his pregnant wife from Ivan's rage. Ivan had beaten the woman so severely that she miscarried. When his son confronted him, Ivan turned on him too. In a blinding rage, he struck out, killing him instantly. With one swift move, Ivan had destroyed his own line of succession. By the time of his death in 1584, the empire was in a shambles. Soon after Ivan came the decade-long so-called time of troubles, a civil war combined with a war of foreign intervention. In the course of that, Muscovy, Russia, came very close to losing its independence. Just one century after achieving independence, Russia was on the brink of disaster. But soon, a Russian giant would appear on the world stage stunning everyone by engineering a shining city in the middle of nowhere. Ivan the Terrible married seven times and even proposed to a lady in the court of Queen Elizabeth I of England. 1696, a new czar comes to power with a revolutionary plan to pick up where Ivan the Terrible left off and transform his backward nation into a modern empire. His name is Peter the Great. Peter the Great was an absolutely unique person. 
a giant, both physically, six and a half feet tall, as well as in terms of personality. He disregarded convention and tradition. He was endlessly curious about new things. Peter's enormous size was matched by his ego. A constant whirlwind of activity occurred around him, uh, and he uh, took on the tasks of a dozen men. He was really an extraordinary, larger-than-life person. Peter had spent his early years in Moscow, carousing with artisans and military men in the city's foreign quarter, learning about their tactics and technology. Peter was not only entranced with European technology, he was also very aware of Russia's backwardness and weakness vis-a-vis -vis Europe. He wanted to remedy that situation. So one of his first acts was he went to Europe, and he went to Europe incognito. And there he studied the craft of shipbuilding with the Dutch, who were masters at it. He also learned the art of navigation from the English Navy. And he saw the great wealth these European empires were pulling out of their overseas colonies. And he figured they might have use for Russian natural resources. But what Peter really wanted was a piece of the action. And he knew that in order to cut into the pie, he would have to drag his country kicking and screaming out of its gloomy medieval backwardness into the great white light of the new commercialism of the Western world. When he got back to Russia, Peter resolved to transform his country into a naval force that would not only trade with the European empires, it would compete with them as a military power. Peter sets his sights on a stretch of land 400 miles north of Moscow, near the Baltic Sea on the Nieva River. With godlike vanity, he began envisioning a new naval city that would put Russia on Europe's map. He would call his vision St. Petersburg. A city on that spot had direct maritime access to Europe. The only problem was that this land on the Nieva belonged to Sweden. Peter would not be deterred. In 1700, he launched an all-out attack and took the land by force. By 1703, the cornerstone of the city was laid. The new capital that Peter had in mind, it was to be a fortress, was to be the center of the army and the navy. It was to be the window on Europe through which Western ideas, modern ideas were going to flood and spread throughout the entire empire. Out of bloodshed and warfare, St. Petersburg was born. But for the people of Russia, their czar's ambition would prove to be a double-edged sword. Peter chose the site of his future city for its access to the Baltic Sea, but this advantage would come with a steep price. For five months out of the year, the River Delta and its surrounding swamps would freeze, and then predictably and reliably flood when they thawed with the warmer months. The building of this city would be a monumental challenge. So Peter turned to the one natural resource that compensated in Russia when all else failed, raw manpower. The people of Russia would literally build St. Petersburg with their bare hands. Surrounded by nothing but swamp, supplies were almost impossible to come by. In order to raise the foundations of the fortress above tide waters, workers had to dig piles of earth with their bare hands and then transport thousands of pounds of soil in their jackets and shirts. Everything had to be imported. Even lumber had to be cut upstream and floated down in huge quantities to stabilize the city's foundations. There's no bedrock there, so that any large structure had to be built on pilings. To do this, engineers designed a pulley system to drive thousands of piles into the soft earth. You raise the, uh, the head, and they would drop it, and that would drive the pile into the ground. And uh, this was repeated tens of thousands of times Petersburg. Within five months, thousands and thousands of laborers had erected the hexagonal walls and the timber bastions of this fortress you see behind me. At night, they'd come home to their camps, freezing and tired and hungry, and just as they had come by the thousands, so they would die by the thousands from disease, from the flooding, and from exhaustion. By 1708, a rough estimate of 25,000 laborers had perished, building this fledgling city, which gave rise to its nickname, the City of Bones. 
There is no statistic that tells us exactly how many people died before this city was finished. But a 19th century historian says that up until that point, there was no single battle in the annals of military history that cost as many lives as the number of laborers who perished in the building of St. Petersburg. For Peter, the human toll was merely a means to an end. In 1706, he launched his first warship from St. Petersburg Admiralty Shipyard. This was the city's first industrial compound. It housed shipbuilders, sail and rope makers, forges, and a cannon foundry. Russia now had a navy, and its czar was single-handedly changing the face of the empire. In 1712, with his usual brisk efficiency, he makes the biggest change of all. In a simple and stunning decree, Peter makes St. Petersburg the capital of Russia. In an instant, Moscow's nearly 300-year supremacy in Russia was over. The citizens of Moscow were stunned. Many Russians reacted to Peter as though he were an alien from outer space. They didn't understand him. He imposed his strange ideas on his country using the full force of an autocratic and absolute monarch, which he inherited from his predecessors, but he knew very well uh, how to use it to get his will. His vision to revolutionize Russia was the thing that drove him throughout his life. Nothing and no one escaped some kind of an effect from this revolutionary process. Peter had spared no expense to create a city from scratch. But by 1714, St. Petersburg was still a long way from being the European power center he envisioned. And Peter's years of hard living were about to catch up with him. Without his dogged will, the entire fantastic endeavor threatened to crumble, leaving Russia once again on the verge of chaos. In 1698, Peter the Great issued a beard tax to be paid by anyone refusing to cut off their old-fashioned Russian beards in favor of a clean-shaven Western look. For decades, Peter the Great had been monastically focused on his twofold task of turning Russia into a great empire and St. Petersburg into its glittering capital. With one exception, he still held his legendary bouts of drinking with his buddies, but as always, his hard partying had very little effect on his relentless energy. He defeated Sweden in the Great Northern War. He'd extended Russia's boundaries from the Baltic all the way to the Pacific. He'd built a new European capital. He'd built a navy. He built schools of engineering and science, and he'd increased Russian trade sevenfold. Military and politically, Russia had become an empire, but it still lacked the one element essential to all empires, prestige. In 1714, Peter began sketching designs for a grand palace atop a 50-foot bluff overlooking the sea, 25 miles outside of St. Petersburg. He would call it Peterhof. The palace would be surrounded by over 600 acres of gardens and crowned by a gilded network of fountains running down the entire face of the bluff. Work on the monumental project began in 1716. Large numbers of army soldiers were actually sent to the estate to dig uh, the trenches that would feed the water through a pipe system to the fountains. In 1719, the country's first hydraulic engineers began work on the intricate system. The palace was built on the heights, and the heights are what feed the water. It's that drop, the gravity in that drop that actually powers the fountains. Using the natural slope of the terrain and water from nearby springs, workers constructed a 14-mile gravity-fed system. The water was stored in upper reservoirs. In a flash, it was released to shoot through wooden pipes down a 50-foot cascade to the fountain's centerpiece. The speeding water accumulated enough force to shoot 65 feet into the air. The result was breathtaking. The fountains were so spectacular, they were dubbed Russia's Versailles. But Peter didn't have much time to enjoy his showpiece. In 1725, 
After wading into freezing water to save a drowning sailor, the great Peter took ill and died. By the end of his reign, Peter had taken Russia from a backward, isolated country to a state-of-the-art empire. But the job was far from done. It would be the ambitious and tenacious German wife of Peter's grandson who would complete St. Petersburg's transformation from a naval fort to the glittering capital we recognize today. Her name was Catherine the Great. Catherine comes to power uh, in the year 1762 by overthrowing her husband, uh, who had been uh, the Russian emperor for only six months. Uh, and she very was able to quite easily topple him. With her power secure, Catherine picks up where Peter the Great left off, transforming Russia into a world power. As a foreigner, as a European, she virtually completed the process of Europeanization, which Peter the Great uh, had begun at the beginning of the century. In fact, Catherine regarded herself as Peter's rightful heir. In the 18th century, in order to be a successful monarch, you had to expand your territory, and this Catherine did brilliantly. Catherine annexed some 200,000 square miles of territory, adding vast new wealth to Russia's coffers and expanding the empire to its greatest lengths to date. Second, you were to introduce a wide-ranging program of reform, and this she did. On the home front, Catherine used her new wealth to modernize her city. She was one of the first Russian rulers to address the squalid living conditions of Russia's poor, with plans for hospitals, sanitation, services, and schools. Catherine, during her reign, um, set up architectural norms for the building of new towns, and she did, in fact, build 216 new towns, uh, complete with plans for how the grid should be laid out, how the central square should be laid out, uh, what kind of facades there should be, what kind of materials should be used in construction. But Catherine's most prestigious building project was the renovation of her royal residence, the empire's most extravagant monument to self-indulgence, the Winter Palace. The Winter Palace was three stories high and 650 feet long. The entire exterior was decorated in more than 200 columns and over 150 carved statues. Inside, it contained more than 500 rooms, almost four times the number of rooms in the White House. Over the course of her reign, Catherine spearheaded a building boom unlike any the empire had ever seen. Her unrivaled power completely transformed St. Petersburg into an ostentatious and unashamed display of the culture, wealth, and power of the Russian Empire. She wrote to one of her correspondents, I can't stop myself from building, but building is like a disease. It's almost like alcoholism. Unrestrained building wasn't the Tsarina's only vice. Behind the doors of the Winter Palace, Catherine was known for another form of patronage, taking good care of her numerous and often much younger lovers. She was a hardworking woman. At night, she wanted to have male company. And there were a number of lovers. She treated them very nicely and very generously. She gave them land, she gave them serfs. But Catherine's lavish court and her absolute power to give human beings as gifts symbolized the gulf that existed between the ruling elite and the average laboring Russian. While she sympathized with her subjects, on the throne of supreme power, Catherine's reforms went only so far. By the end of Catherine's reign in 1796, Russia was a superpower, but the country's strength brought it new glory and new enemies. By 1812, Europe's most ambitious general was engaged in a march of conquest across Europe, unlike any seen since the Roman Empire, and Russia was about to become his next victim. Catherine the Great was the first leader to initiate a large-scale inoculation program. In 1768, she immunized herself and her subjects against smallpox. At the time of her death in 1796, Catherine had added 200,000 square miles of territory 
to the Russian Empire. Over 40 million people were now considered Russians. When her grandson, Alexander I, took the throne in 1801, Russia was a major player in world affairs. This made Russia an alluring trophy for Europe's most dangerous general, Napoleon Bonaparte. And in 1812, Tsar Alexander would face a challenge unseen in Russia since the Mongol invasion six centuries earlier. Napoleon posed a considerable threat to uh, Russia. He had already brought virtually all of Europe under his control. Napoleon entered Russia with an unprecedented army of over 500,000 men. The Russians knew they could not stop this army on the battlefield, so they adopted a tactic of strategic retreat, burning the countryside to starve out Napoleon's troops as they pushed toward Moscow. Once in the capital, Napoleon would realize he had underestimated the steely resolve of the Russian Tsar. Napoleon probably thought that having invaded Russia, seized the old capital, Alexander would be willing to come to terms with him. Alexander was not. He simply ignored Napoleon until a very harsh winter forced Napoleon to realize that there was nothing to be gained by sitting in Moscow, and so Napoleon began to retreat. Forced to march back over the demolished and frozen landscape from which they came, less than 10% of the men out of Napoleon's original army survived. Mother Russia had broken the unbeatable general. In 1883, Alexander's successor commissioned a grand monument to be placed in the heart of St. Petersburg's Palace Square. It would be a towering symbol of Russian defiance. It was called the Alexander Column. The Alexander Column rests on a granite shaft, red finish granite. It's a monolith, it's one piece. Once again, a Russian czar forced his people to literally move mountains to build a monument in the name of the empire. An army of Russians methodically carved the shaft of the column out of the side of a mountain in one piece and shipped it to St. Petersburg. It was a process that took three years and thousands of workers. Once in St. Petersburg, Engineers faced the daunting task of raising the 700-ton, 83-foot-tall granite monolith. It was sort of a giant halter. It was fastened onto the column. And then placed around it were capstans, which were manned by dozens of people. And at a given signal, they would all move, and through a pulley system, the column would gradually move upward and fall into the place that had been prepared for it on the base. Today, the column remains freestanding on its pedestal at a full height of 155 feet. It has proved to be absolutely perfectly engineered. Napoleon's collapse eliminated any threat to Russia's status as the world's largest overland empire. By the turn of the 19th century, Russia stretched 6,000 miles from the Baltic Sea in the west to the Pacific in the east, and all the way to Alaska. It consisted of one-sixth of the world's landmass, crossed 15 time zones, and under a new czar, it would continue expanding. And Nicholas II, because of his early experience traveling in Asia, the first of the czars to travel to Asian destinations, took into his reign a real conviction that Russia's future lay on the Pacific. But with its territory now extending beyond the horizon, the empire was in danger of collapsing under its own size. Russia's engineers would execute a solution as far-reaching as the empire itself. They would build the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Those who promoted the building of what was then the world's longest railroad in the 1890s, had in mind uh, both economic and political objectives. It was to open up the Far East to Russian exports. At the same time, it was to establish Russian power in the Far East. On May 31st, 1891, 
the first piece was laid of a railroad that would span a distance of 5,768 miles, the equivalent of crossing the continental United States twice. This was an engineering project on a scale never before attempted. The question of how the railway was built is, a, is a, frankly one that makes you sort of stop in awe. The railroad was designed to be built in sections, and it would require thousands of workers, engineers, soldiers, and even convicts to do the job. In a typical stretch of the railway cutting across um, um, vast areas of southern Siberian forest, an initial wave of workers would clear the land, felling the trees to open the path for the railroad. Then a great deal of labor would go into building necessary earth bulwarks to raise the rails. Then once the woods were cleared and the bulwark was established, the rails would be brought in and laid. Transporting supplies to these remote sites would prove to be a major challenge. After all, the railroad did not yet exist. Tracks had to be laid piecemeal so that workers could use the emerging railroad to transport steel from the west and continue building section by section. And this process was repeated uh, week after week, month after month, over all the years of the late uh, imperial period. The endless toil broke the backs of Russia's workers. It was a very hard job to take, very hard job to take. I mean, you gotta conjure an image of isolated wilderness that was transformed into rough and ready workers' camps, with uh, workers camped out under tents, uh, or, or in some cases in earthen dugouts, uh, working for months at a time on stretches of track with uh, relatively limited supplies in the winter, uh, subject to extremely cold temperatures in the summer, to the terrific heat of uh, Russia's continental climate. By 1904, the core railroad was complete. Russia had a lifeline to the east and was free to pursue its next object of conquest, Asia. The problem, of course, was that this put Russia into direct conflict with Japan, which had very similar political and economic objectives. This conflict of objectives led to war between Russia and Japan. In 1905, Russia went to war and suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Japanese. Back at home, the loss fanned the flames of growing resentment toward the Tsar. Then in 1914, the Tsar led his country into yet another war, one that would starve, ravage, and utterly decimate the population, World War I. After centuries of building the world's largest empire with blood, the Russian Tsar was now pushing his people to their breaking point. On March 15, 1917, the people revolted. Tsar Nicholas II was removed from power. The nearly 500-year reign of the Russian Tsars had been destroyed. The key factor in the disintegration of the Russian Empire in 1917-18 was the collapse of the Tsarist regime, because it was the emperor who really provided the glue that held the empire together. The Tsars had used their power to build breathtaking cathedrals, whole cities from swamps, railroads that crossed a continent, and sumptuous palaces that remain unrivaled in their opulence. The history of the Russian Empire can be read as an enormous achievement. At the same time, that achievement came at important costs. In many respects, the empire was built on the backs of ordinary Russians. In late 1917, the Tsar's achievements would be rewritten by a new regime, one determined to level the playing field for Russia's poor. As the mighty empire grew, it would consume more and more of its own to build a palatial playground for the rich and an industrial hell for the rest. By the beginning of the 20th century, Russia's overworked and illiterate poor had had it. Broken by world war, incited by radicals, these people would rise up to demolish the Russia they had suffered for in a fiery revolution that would replace one colossal empire with another. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel. England, once dominated by Roman conquerors, 
this tiny island nation rose to become one of the largest and most powerful empires in history. Its reach stretched around the globe, spanning every continent. It was unimaginably large. Technology, innovation, ambition, these were the tools that built this massive empire and produced the formidable British Navy, a powerhouse that dominated the world's oceans. The Royal Navy is like the Microsoft of the global system in the 18th and 19th century. They are everywhere. The British Empire constructed massive symbols of dominance that still invoke awe today. But the foundations of that empire were built on ego, bloodshed, and a relentless drive for conquest. AD, the most powerful empire the world had ever known is under attack. At the far edges of the British Isles, the once mighty Roman legions march toward the coast in full retreat. They leave in their wake a military and political void. For the first time in more than 400 years, the vulnerable island nation of Britain must fend for itself. It was the end of one empire and the beginning of another. The sun never sets on the British Empire. I've heard those words all my life, ever since I was a kid, even though I've never lived in England, and that empire is long gone. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. At its height, the British Empire covered almost a quarter of the Earth's land mass, some 14 million square miles. And if you think about that, that's just staggering. But how did an island, if you will, in the middle of the North Atlantic come to be such a behemoth empire? Well, in the early 400s AD, when those Roman citizens were fleeing in the face of an onslaught of Vikings and Jutes and Angles and Saxons, some of those marauding and plundering people decided to stay. Maybe they liked the temperate climate. And after several centuries, they'd organized and developed themselves into somewhat of an Anglo or English identity. But with the death of the last true Saxon king, Edward the Confessor, the door was open for another people to step in, the Normans, who were essentially descendants of the Vikings living in northern France. And at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, the Normans did that very thing. They took England under the leadership of a man named William, who we call today William the Conqueror. With a ravenous lust for power, William would stop at nothing to become king of England. To conquer another country like England, you couldn't really be a, a sort of touchy-feely kind of person. You had to be a very strong leader, and that's what he was. He was a brutal man. In 1066, William made his move. He put together an army of Normans and stormed the shores of England. For several bloody hours, his forces viciously clashed with King Harold's near the English coastal town of Hastings. By the end of the day, with one strike, William had conquered England. Now he would borrow a chapter from the Romans and launch a series of extraordinary building projects that would transform the English landscape. He imposes himself on England, and he builds these castles around the country. Now, we look at castles, and we think, don't they look nice? A Norman castle is not nice. It was big, it towered over your town, and it was a reminder to say that you are under us now. And, of course, the biggest one he builds is the Tower of London. William wanted the Tower of London to be intimidating. He chose a location on the bank of the River Thames that had once been used by the Romans. The new tower would be built on those foundations, capitalizing on the Roman legacy of power and glory. The complex would include a defensive wall surrounding an imposing tower over 90 feet tall. It would be the largest fortress in England. So it's really built to scare everyone off and to, to say, you know, this, this country is mine, I'm, I'm not going anywhere, I'm staying. 
and don't think that anyone can get rid of me. Of course, the people they use to build it are the locals who have to do it, so they use them effectively as slave labor. Building onto the remains of the Roman walls, workers first constructed the barrier around the complex. On the north and west side, where there were no Roman remains, they dug ditches and erected large wooden stakes as a barricade. Then they turned to the massive tower itself. For 700 years, England had relied on simple timber construction. Now William and the Normans would bring back the grandeur of Roman engineering techniques. Like the Romans, William would build his tower with stone. He didn't trust the quality of the local material, so he imported cream-colored limestone from France. His engineers also incorporated Romanesque arches and vaults within the structure for support. Inside the tower's majestic cathedral, workers constructed a series of intersecting barrel vaults called groin vaults. These allowed the support to rest on four piers, opening a soaring space for windows to lighten the imposing interior. It was a great feat for that time because the English were used to building in wood, so I think it was rather miraculous for them to see this enormous structure go up. It was really impregnable. I mean, the, the walls were tremendously thick and they were just little slits to look out from. The fearsome castle served as a royal residence, fort, stronghold and prison and intimidation was backed up by swift and severe reprisal against any who dared challenge the king. You get armed men, and they go up, and they land on your doorstep. They will drive you out of your home. They will burn your home down. They will burn your crops so you've got nothing to live on, and a lot of killing, of course. As the tower neared completion in 1087, William died, ending 21 years of turbulent rule. His imposing fortress would be a reminder of his vision and tyranny for centuries to come. A series of Norman kings succeeded William and continued his work on the complex. But it would be more than 400 years later that the tower would enter its bloodiest phase. And the king who led it there was not Norman, but from the English family of Tudors, he would become one of the most brutal and gluttonous rulers in England's history. His name was Henry VIII. Henry's appetites were legendary. He hungered for food, for women, for power, and for a son who would one day inherit the crown. The best way to fulfill your duty and your destiny as a king is to produce a safe line of male heirs. And if you look at the portraits of Tudor gentlemen, they're standing with their legs apart and their hands on their hips with these big cod pieces. That is not by accident. That is saying, I am virile. Look at me, I can produce families. So a son is a sign of manhood. When his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, failed to produce a son, Henry set his sights on one of her ladies in waiting, the alluring Anne Boleyn. He falls absolutely hopelessly in, both in love and in lust with Anne Boleyn, because Anne is a very, very sexy lady, and she knows it. There's only one problem. Um, how do you get rid of your wife? Apart from murdering her, of course. And the answer is, I've got to divorce her. When the Pope refused to grant Henry a divorce, the king flew into a rage. If he couldn't control his country's religion, he would simply replace it. He boldly severed all ties with Rome and appointed himself head of the new Church of England. Henry now had absolute control over his country. He divorced Catherine and made Anne his queen. But when she also failed to produce a son, she suddenly found herself accused of adultery. The case is made as damaging as it's possible to be, that she's not just having one affair, that she's having a string of affairs, that there are sort of orgies going on in, in the palace, and Henry is only too ready to believe a lot of this. Henry had Anne arrested and held in the greatly expanded Tower of London. By now, the tower complex had grown to a sprawling 18 acres with an impenetrable facade. The wooden barricade had been replaced and expanded by thick stone walls, 
A series of towers reinforced their strength and stability. Just inside the outer wall, a second wall was constructed to provide another layer of fortification. A ditch had been dug around the perimeter and filled with water to form a moat. With these added defenses, the tower complex was virtually undefeatable. Under Henry's ruthless reign, the fortress became the location for an orgy of violence, a notorious prison, dungeon, and execution ground for his many enemies. And it was here that Anne awaited her fate, death by beheading. Axe executions were actually really nasty because it was not uncommon for the axe not to finish the job in one blow. What he does with Anne Boleyn, he says, for you, darling, nothing but the best. Instead of having her beheaded with an axe, he's going to have her beheaded nice and neatly with a sword. On May 19th, 1536, Anne was led to a private courtyard on the tower's grounds. With one swift stroke, Henry's problem was solved. But Henry's longing for a son was only part of a more ambitious quest. Since the beginning of his reign, he had lusted after a dream of ultimate glory to transform England into an empire. This idea of a realm that would cover every part of Europe uh, and extend beyond was always in the back of Henry VIII's mind. His real vision and dream, his great appetite was for dominion and empire. But Henry's road to empire put him on a collision course with France and Spain, Europe's reigning superpowers. His plan of attack, to fill the high seas with floating weapons of mass destruction. Six ravens are always kept at the Tower of London. Legend has it that if they leave, the kingdom will fall. Summer, 1510. An army of laborers scour England's forests, gathering material for a colossal undertaking on England's road to empire. Before King Henry VIII could conquer the land, he needed to conquer the sea. He set out to radically transform the way battles were fought and won by turning his ships into deadly weapons. He is the one who first begins putting heavy guns on ships to put these large siege warfare type guns, ship cracking guns, some of them weighing almost a ton on shipboard that could be used to batter your enemy into submission. Massive guns required massive ships. Henry ordered his naval engineers to build a new and imposing fleet. The centerpiece, his flagship, was one of the world's first battleships. It was called the Mary Rose. The Mary Rose really epitomizes the mentality of naval planners of that age. Get as many guns pointing as many directions on shipboard as you possibly can. And that's what the Mary Rose was set to become, a gun platform. The Mary Rose featured a breakthrough advance in warship design, gun ports. Holes were carved into the side of the ship with flaps that could be lowered over them. These holes allowed cannons to be positioned and fired through the side. Naval designers could now engineer decks dedicated solely to firepower. The added weapons turned the Mary Rose into a killing machine. This was a, a major revolution, really, in ship design, of which the Mary Rose was the sort of very beginning. By the mid-16th century, England's march toward naval dominance was in full flow. But Henry soon ran into a problem. The cost of arming his ships with expensive bronze guns was quickly draining England's treasure chest. He's got to find other ways to produce the kinds of, you know, heavy artillery, which can help his armies and his navy fight effectively, but at uh, a lower cost. And the cast iron gun's the perfect solution. The cast iron gun runs less than a fifth of the cost of a bronze one. A successful cast iron cannon had never been made before. 
but Henry knew how to make it happen. He turned to the country's famous iron-making region, the Weald, and gave his engineers a mandate. The difficulty with casting in iron, a large piece like a cannon, was the fact that, for a start, iron had to be melted at a much higher temperature. There was only one way to get the temperatures high enough, an engineering wonder of the time, the blast furnace. First, workers poured wood and iron ore into the top of a 20-foot tall stone furnace. A water wheel powered a large bellows that pumped air into the fire, stoking it until it reached an incredible 2,200 degrees, hot enough to melt the iron. Workers then opened a tap at the base of the furnace. A stream of hot molten iron poured down a trough and filled a cannon mold buried deep in the ground. It was a very big undertaking, and it was very pressured as well. You had, of course, charcoal burners who produced the charcoal in the woods around the furnace. You had laborers who dug the iron ore from pits in the ground. Uh, you had teams of laborers bringing wagon loads of ore and charcoal to the furnace. Over the next few centuries, the Weald's iron cannons became the envy and dread of every other European ruler. The transformation is tremendous. It gave England power and a technological edge that no other European power could match. In just 30 years, Henry had built his navy into a powerhouse, but he would never live to see his ultimate dream of European conquest. Enormously obese, his oversized appetites finally betrayed him. He died in January 1547, leaving a legacy of brutality and innovation that stands through the ages. His reign had laid the seeds that would explode into a mighty empire. And Henry lays the foundations all right by building a navy, by building this notion of Britain as forming an empire, an imperial presence in the world. Backed by the growing power of their navy, England's empire would expand over the next 150 years through colonization and conquest. By the mid-18th century, Britain controlled parts of India, Africa, the West Indies, and North America. But two major threats to the burgeoning empire loomed ahead. And the king who would fight them, George III, would also be battling demons of his own. It's always talked about as his madness. It was a physical illness that he had, but the effect was that it affected his brain. George first slipped into madness in 1788, seven years after suffering a withering blow. A small territory a world away had defeated the mighty British in a war of independence. It was called America. When the British troops leave um, Yorktown, when the, the, you know, they, they surrender, they play this tune, the world turned upside down. And that is really how it seems. The world has turned upside down, the world's gone mad. When rebels win. Over the next decade, George's world slowly caved in on him. Then, in 1804, another threat would send the king and his empire spiraling to the brink. French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. By the early 1800s, the tyrannical conqueror was quickly overtaking Europe. England was his last obstacle to continental dominance. He was as large a threat as the Nazis were in the Second World War. He was amassing the forces for an invasion of the British Isles. England's Royal Navy had become a major force at sea. And in 1805, it faced Napoleon's invasion threat head on in the momentous Battle of Trafalgar. Using fearless naval tactics and the most technically advanced ships of the age, England annihilated the combined forces of the French and Spanish fleets. Trafalgar confirms Britain's position as the supreme maritime power, and the British emerge as the unsurpassed masters of those naval technologies. But by the time of Napoleon's final defeat in 1815, 
King George III was permanently gripped by insanity, becoming a mere figurehead of power. His mind is completely gone. His eyesight goes as well, and he wanders up and down the corridors of Windsor Castle, has to be fed like a baby. Um, long beard, long hair, uh, no idea what day it is. It's just very sad. By this time, England was growing rapidly into a superpower, based on the supremacy of its naval engineering. But it would be another realm of technical superiority that would catapult the British Empire to global dominance. The 19th century was about to usher in a period of engineering invention not seen since the Romans. The Mary Rose sank in a battle with the French in 1545. In 1982, the ship was raised from the bottom of the sea. By the 19th century, Britain had developed into an industrial titan, bursting with wealth. Its monumental success came from a period of staggering technological invention that swept across the empire and then dominated the globe. It's hard to think of a period in history where you had so much creativity in terms of, of technology, so much willing to experiment with the possibilities of what you can do with machines, what you can do with engineering, what you can do with architecture. In the past, empires had been built by hand now the British would dominate their territory with machines. Engineering innovations like cast iron and the turning of a warship into a single ballistic offensive entity with guns transformed the English Navy. And that Navy transformed England into an empire. And that military and commercial empire that spread from Europe to Asia, from the Americas to Africa, dominated the seas. But what about the land? Because by the early 1800s, Britain was jumping with productivity, but lacking in means of overland distribution. Well, in 1782, a man named James Watt perfected an engine driven by steam. But it was 40 years later that George Stevenson and his son Robert took that engine and with a firebox, boiler, piston, and a remarkable invention called the chimney, powered a locomotive called the rocket over tracks at the blistering speed of 29 miles an hour and revolutionized overland commercial transportation with the railroad. The rocket was not the first locomotive, but its unique engineering features proved that steam trains were the force of the future. The key to its speed was in its engine. A series of copper pipes carried hot gases from a coal-fueled firebox through a chamber of water, bringing it to a boil. This created steam that rose up into a dome and was forced through a valve into a cylinder. The intense pressure from the steam pushed a piston rod that connected to the wheels of the locomotive, powering it forward. By venting the exhaust steam out of a chimney instead of the cylinder, fresh air was sucked into the firebox stoking the fire. With this advance, the rocket could charge ahead at blazing speeds. Of all the locomotives that were imagined at the time, it's the one that looks the most like a locomotive will. I mean, it's, it's gonna be improved in innumerable ways, but that basic machine is the one that, that emerges as a locomotive for the next century. The race was on to build railroads across Britain. And in 1833, a brilliant and brash engineer rose to prominence when he entered the railroad game. His name was Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Brunel was a real showman. He dressed well, he had a beautiful wife. He was a celebrity, uh, and he knew how to play that to a hilt. Uh, he was also a workaholic. Uh, he had a very difficult time delegating. Brunel had a bold vision for his railway. It would be the most ambitious project to date, a massive network of railroads connecting all of England together. He called it the Great Western Railway, and he was determined to make it the fastest line ever created. He wanted a track which was on a very, very shallow gradient so that the trains would be able to travel that much faster. 
The need for speed meant going through mountains rather than over them, and this led to his greatest engineering marvel. Today, it is known as the Box Tunnel. It was necessary, essentially, to chisel through rock, and the length of the tunnel was something like one and three quarter miles, which was really astonishing for this time. That's a really serious tunnel, even by today's standards. Brunel amassed hundreds of Irish workers called navvies to dig the tunnel. They began by sinking a series of shafts from the top of the hill. Gunpowder was used to blast through the rock. Then the navvies were lowered in baskets down the shaft, where they excavated the materials with basic hand tools. Horses turned winches that pulled the material to the top of the hill. It was a, a slow, painful, and sometimes quite a dangerous process, of course. Uh, and there were fatalities on the box tunnel during its construction. Lots of dust, lots of grime, uh, and when the explosions were going off, the risk of flying rock. After four years of work that claimed more than 100 lives, the box tunnel was finished. The Great Western Railway finally opened in 1841. Trains still run through the box tunnel to this day. The railway mania that Brunel helped ignite eventually spread to the rest of the empire, tightening England's stranglehold on power around the world. Railways in the middle of the 19th century, first in England and then wherever they spread, they're sources of just incredible wonder. They're big, they're loud, they're dirty, and they're just power. And they represent speed, they represent the conquest of space and time. They're literally awesome machines. With the runaway success of the railway, Britain was now decades ahead of the rest of the world in modern engineering technology. Their empire was fast approaching its apex. But a staggering blow to its nerve center would rattle the empire to its very foundations. The first person to be killed by a train was a member of parliament. He was struck by the rocket in 1830. October 1834. In the dark of the London night, a violent fire rages through the very heart of the British Empire, Westminster Palace. For centuries, this complex of buildings had been the command center of British power and a towering symbol of its strength. Now, as flames turn the palace into a roaring inferno, thousands watch in shock and horror, wondering what will become of their mighty government. The fire of 1834 had dealt a devastating blow to the political nerve center of the British Empire. Westminster Palace had stood in some form or another since the late 11th century during the time of William the Conqueror. And now these ruins had the British people wondering, would Parliament ever meet again in this place? Would Parliament ever rise and vote again in these magnificent buildings that had given birth to the modern political process? Well. A royal commission was appointed to decide this very thing, and the royal commission decided, yes, parliament would be reconstructed in this place. But now a more difficult question came up. What would these buildings look like? Would they be neo-Gothic, French, Italian, or English? Or would they be the perpendicular style of Elizabethan Tudor or English Renaissance? A sort of a civic war happened for two years until 1836. The royal commission, over 97 proposals, chose the plan of a man named Charles Berry, who was a fan of the Italian Renaissance, but he combined those elements with neo-Gothic, and he gave us this, the houses of parliament we have today, a sort of a mishmash of styles, but a stunning mishmash nonetheless. From the ruins of the old parliament, British architects would design a government building of staggering proportions, twice the size of the U.S. Capitol. Constructed of sand-colored limestone called Anston, the palace would take up eight acres of land, with towers soaring as much as 320 feet into the sky. It was decided that one of these massive structures would be a grand clock tower. Today, we know it as Big Ben. 
you're able to measure time much more accurately in the 19th century and time is important time comes to mean money and there's there's something of a of a revolution in the 19th century about timekeeping um, so if you're going to have this this latest building yeah a clock tower goes on it when the royal astronomer George Airy announced his requirements for the clock people were stunned it would be the largest and most ambitious timepiece the world had ever seen. Now, Aries' demands for excellence were fairly rigorous. For instance, one of his requirements was that the clock be accurate to within one second every 24-hour period, and furthermore, that the accuracy reports of this clock be telegraphed on down the River Thames to the Greenwich Observatory twice a day. Now, this was not the 21st century age of information. A digital clockmaker today, this would not be shooting for the moon. But a 19th century clockmaker, to make such a great clock in a huge tower with such heavy striking mechanisms, pushing such heavy hands, with such precision and such accuracy that would be exposed to the rain, wind, and elements second after second, hour after hour, week after week, year after year, this was absolutely unimaginable. It was like going to the moon. So Parliament, rightfully, asked Airy if he might come up with a plan that was a little bit more reasonable, a little less expensive. But Airy was adamant. And thus the clock today we call Big Ben, which is really the name of the bell, became the standard for timekeeping the world over. Incredibly, it was an amateur clockmaker by the name of Edmund Beckett Dennison who designed the famous clock when all other experts failed to meet the challenge of pinpoint accuracy. Like all clocks of this type, Denison's would be powered by weights, gears, and a pendulum. But Big Ben's design featured a groundbreaking new device that would protect the pendulum from outside forces. Two metal arms control a wheel with three spokes. With each swing of the pendulum, one of the arms opens allowing the wheel to turn a notch. This regulates the movement of the clock. When rain or snow weighs down the clock's hands, the arms isolate the pendulum so it keeps swinging without being affected. To fine tune the clock's accuracy, timekeepers simply reach into their own pockets. Pennies are used um, as part of its uh, uh, regulating its accuracy by adding or taking away um, one of these old pennies from the pendulum, um, the uh, clock can actually gain or, or, or lose two-fifths of a second um, in 24 hours. With this brilliant but simple method, the clock became world famous as a marvel of precision engineering. The clock tower over the Parliament at the center of the empire has a peculiarly powerful symbolic importance. It's as if time itself is governed by the British. In addition to the clock, a series of bells was needed to toll the passing time, with an enormous central bell ringing on the hour. A bell founder by the name of George Mears cast the giant bell to Denison's precise specifications, and Big Ben was born, weighing a staggering 13 tons. Huge crowds lined the streets of London and cheered as Big Ben was transported to the Finnish clock tower in 1858. It has been filling London with its distinctive rings ever since. London grew as a city tremendously. It was really the, the first large-scale conurbation in the world. Uh, and as a city, it had to have its icons, uh, and the ultimate icon being the, the mother of parliaments, the parliamentary building with Big Ben as a symbol of the strength and the power of the British Empire. By the mid-19th century, Great Britain had set the gold standard for technological achievement. But under the reign of a young, naive queen, a crisis would strike London and push it to the brink of disaster. A flock of birds landed on the minute hand of Big Ben in 1949 and set the time back five minutes. In 1837, a teenage girl takes the reins of the most powerful empire on earth. 
Her rise to power ignites turmoil throughout Great Britain. Both her subjects and her government view her as spoiled, impetuous, and unprepared to rule. Her name was Queen Victoria. She was only 18 when she came to the throne, and she'd had a very, very difficult um, first couple of years on the throne, and in fact, was very unpopular. There was little to indicate this immature girl would grow up to become a revered symbol of the empire's immense power. Her transformation started when she married her cousin Albert in 1840. She fell in love almost at first sight. All her life, actually, she wants someone to lean on, uh, metaphorically and indeed literally. And um, Albert is able to take her in hand, rather. So he comes in and he helps her grow up. By this time, the empire stretched around the world, from North America to Australia. Albert and Victoria pushed for greatness in engineering and technology, knowing how crucial these advances were to their expanding empire. None more so than the emerging technology of the telegraph. You've got an empire which is extending literally around the globe. People talked about the annihilation of space and time through electrical telegraph. The telegraph industry exploded around the world, with Britain leading the charge. During the mid-19th century, over 97,000 miles of twisted steel telegraph cables were laid. A message could now be sent from Britain to India in a matter of hours. The world's first information superhighway had arrived, and with it, the empire could consolidate its power more effectively than ever before. It's an enormous feat, no question. Um, I, it's something which simply was not conceivable before they, they did it. Engineering advances not only united the empire, they triggered a manufacturing boom unlike any seen before. People flocked from rural areas to city centers to take advantage of job opportunities. And as productivity skyrocketed, so did the population of its nerve center, London. So whereas it had been a million at the beginning of the 19th century, it was then, um, by the 1850s, it was already two million. And London was not designed for this. Um, and there was terrible overcrowding. Really, people were living like in, as though they were in a chicken coop. London was bursting with people. Cramped and overcrowded, sanitation problems spread like wildfire. Waste flowed into sewers meant only for rainwater, filling it with raw sewage that emptied directly into the Thames River. The situation was ripe for disaster. Now, you would think the Thames, huge river, that would be a great way of disposing of London's waste. But unfortunately, it was also London's water supply. So the waste of two million Londoners was being shunted into the Thames, and then Londoners were actually drinking this. 1848, catastrophe strikes London. A cholera epidemic sweeps through the congested city, killing more than 14,000. Three years later, another outbreak occurs, claiming an additional 10,000 victims. Cemeteries fill up with bodies. The most advanced city in the world faced conditions that had not been seen since the Black Death of the Middle Ages. In the, the space of 30 years, over 30,000 Londoners died, and this was because of cholera, and because cholera was spreading through London's polluted water supply. It was shocking. Something needed to be done. England turned to an engineer by the name of Joseph Bazalgette. His solution would revolutionize urban planning. He and thousands of city workers would build the most advanced sewer system to date. Basil Jet's innovative plan was to install giant intercepting sewers on each side of the Thames, running parallel to the water. These main pipes would be connected to more than 1,300 miles of older city sewers, collecting the waste and diverting it away from the river. The genius of the system was that uh, gravity was used wherever possible um, to actually move the sewage out of London. So the sewers actually ran at an incline. When gravity wasn't enough to carry the flow, Basil Jet built grand pumping stations. Their large steam-driven engines lifted the sewage until gravity could take over once again. 
the sewers guided the waste into two deep reservoirs where it would be stored and released at high tide when nature could dispose of it neatly. The sewer system really was one of the marvels of, of the 19th century. It used 300 million bricks. Um, there was extraordinary earth moving. It was a, a truly colossal task and, 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 and brilliant, amazing. This extraordinary engineering feat transformed London into the first modern glittering metropolis. Cities throughout Europe studied its design with awe. But the disease epidemic wouldn't be the last crisis of Victoria's reign. If you read Hard Times or Oliver Twist or David Copperfield or any of the other genius works by Charles Dickens, you'll get a sense of the staggering overpopulation in London in the 19th century. And some of the fallout of this horror was the sheer volume of traffic in London, a chaos of pedestrians and horses and carriages and carts hauling everything from hay to hardware. The traffic from the south alone was bottlenecking the London Bridge such that London felt like it was choking to death on its own success. London needed another river crossing, but a traditional bridge would block the big merchant boats coming up river to the port. No, what London needed was a drawbridge, like that one. The drawbridge would be the largest and most sophisticated of its kind. It would be called the Tower Bridge. The structure is solid steel covered in stone to make it look like the nearby Tower of London. When the bridge was built, the 1,200-ton leaves, or bascules, were lifted by steam-driven engines. The power turned toothed pinions along a curved steel rack riveted to the outside girders. A solid pivot rotated as the pinion raised the structure. The bascules lifted to an 83-degree angle, allowing ships to pass through. The rising of the bridge only took one minute to raise it, so it was an incredible feat of engineering. It took more than 400 men and eight years to build Tower Bridge. Today, it is one of the most famous and recognizable bridges in the world. Despite being the driving force behind these staggering works of engineering, Albert didn't live to see them. He died in 1861, shattering Victoria. Queen Victoria fell into grief the like you have never seen. For close to 10 years, Victoria sat in isolation from her country. But when she finally re-emerged into public life, she was stronger and more powerful than ever before. The immature teenager had redefined herself into a ruler of the modern age and took her rightful place as leader of the British Empire. All over the world, statues to Victoria are erected. Uh, there are massive celebrations all over the world, and in many cases, those celebrations are joined by the colonized peoples. She becomes a figure of affection. Victoria had become the symbol of the empire's splendor and might, and her reign would mark the apex of British power around the world. The British Empire now had possessions on every major continent and could claim more than 400 million people under its rule. No other country could rival its immense power. It was the largest empire the world would ever see. Queen Victoria died in 1901 at the dawn of the 20th century. She presided over a realm as large, as optimistic, confident, and as innovative as any in history. The British Empire had dragged mankind smashing into the modern age with mass production, rapid transit and communication. The world would never be the same. Every single country and culture on this planet today has benefited in some way or another from British vision and imagination. The sun may have finally set on the British Empire, but regarding the miracles of the modern age, the sun never burned brighter. For the History Channel, I'm Peter Weller. Ancient Persia, fearless, formidable, unrelenting, for ages shrouded in mystery, 
an empire unparalleled in conquest and riches. To create an empire of the size of the Persian Empire, the largest empire the world had known, obviously takes military skills. From North Africa to Asia, it was a civilization driven by a dynasty of extraordinary rulers, ambitious and all-powerful. Cyrus the Great is one of the few who deserves to be called the Great. The Persian Empire created some of the most astonishing feats of engineering the world has ever seen. Magnificent palaces that rose up from barren desert. Roadways, bridges, and canals. Everyone has heard of the Suez Canal, but how many have heard of Darius's Canal? But dark clouds were on the horizon. An ancient rivalry with Greece would erupt into an epic clash that changed the course of history and shaped the Western world for thousands of years to come. Three thirty BC, a young Macedonian king conquers the Persian Empire and leads his invading army into Persepolis, its spectacular capital city. The Macedonian ruler is Alexander the Great, an admirer of the great Persian kings. By sundown, the Greek victory celebration degenerates into a drunken melee. By sunup, Persepolis, the crown jewel of the Persian Empire, with palaces unrivaled anywhere in the world, is burned to the ground. More than 2,500 years later, these immense towers stand as testament to the soaring heights this now forgotten empire once reached. I equate Persia with luxury, with rich tapestries and beautiful rugs and my mother's fat, fuzzy Persian cat named Otis. But I also think of a fantastic Persian king named Cyrus the Great who believed in religious and cultural tolerance and who freed the Jews from Babylon to return to Israel. Hello, I'm Peter Weller and welcome to the Persian Empire. Around 4000 BC, two nomadic tribes were starting to take root in a rich but hot Iranian plateau, the Medes in the north, the Persians in the south. Being as that these tribes were nomadic, they were more interested in survival than conquest. As they became less nomadic, they had to learn how to farm, in particular how to cultivate this fertile Iranian plateau. But to do that, they needed a source of water. The early Persians may have very well become dust in the winds of history had they not unlocked a source of water and just as importantly, a means to channel that water to their crops and settlements. And what makes this engineering feat so remarkable is that they found this water not from rivers or lakes or oceans, but from the most unlikely source of all, rocks. Persia emerged out of nothing, a rugged, hostile terrain built with only invention and determination. 3,000 years ago, nomadic early Persians roamed the parched, forbidding Iranian plateau. Finding water meant traveling long distances. It fell to a hybrid engineer, geologist and diviner called Amogani to figure out how to bring it back to his people. Using nothing more than stone chisels, Moganis would build the first cornerstone of the Persian Empire a breakthrough system of underground irrigation canals called canats. They began by harnessing gravity to exploit the natural topography of their land, which sloped relentlessly down from the Alborz Mountains towards the Persian Gulf. Vertical shafts were first dug down from the surface, and the tunnel was excavated horizontally for a short distance. Then another vertical shaft was built, approximately three quarters of a mile up the slope, and the channel continued. It can be sometimes 20, 30, 40 kilometers away, so it's a very skilled operation, to the point where the gradient of the, of the water channel uh, meets the aquifer or the, uh, the, the groundwater sloping up at, at the point where the mountains begin. The angle of the slope was crucial, one unit in elevation for every hundred on the horizontal. 
not too steep because that would erode the base of the of the water channel and of course not so flat uh, as to prevent the water from moving to its intended destination. 2,000 years before Rome's legendary aqueducts, the Persians were channeling massive amounts of water over long distances. In hot, dry climates, with minimal loss due to leakage or evaporation. Water means food, but the engineering technology to locate that water and move it was a carrot that the Persians were dangling in front of their neighbors. Around 700 BC, all of these tribes were united under one legendary figure named Achaemenes, who founded a dynasty. But this dynasty thrived and flourished under one guy, a guy I would have liked to have met, named Cyrus the Great. Cyrus created and maintained an empire, thanks no doubt to his military savvy, but he was also a political genius. He was an excellent, benevolent manager of men. Historians have called him humanist. The Jews call him Mashiach or anointed one, his own people called him father, and even the Ionian Greeks whom he conquered called him a just and worthy lawgiver and ruler. Cyrus the Great came to power in 559 BC. It was the beginning of the Achaemenid dynasty. Their reign would change the course of history and redefine architectural possibility. If you're looking at the greatest personages in history, who have affected the world. Cyrus the Great is one of the few who deserves that epithet, the one who deserves to be called the Great. The empire over which Cyrus ruled was the largest the ancient world had ever seen and may be to this day the largest empire ever. By 554 BC, Cyrus had crushed all rivals and became the undisputed leader of Persia. Now it was time to conquer the world. And if he was going to build an empire, he would need a magnificent capital city to reflect its growing stature. In 550 BC, Cyrus launched one of the most ambitious engineering projects anywhere in the ancient world. The Persian Empire's first great capital city at Pasargad, located in modern Iran. Cyrus was a very innovative builder, and I might add that his standards were particularly high. We can also say that his building project reflected in some ways the technologies that he found in the course of his various conquests. Like the Romans centuries later, the Persians were borrowers. They took the best and most advanced ideas from the cultures they conquered, then developed them even further into technologies uniquely their own. The art and engineering of Pasargad drew on influences as far flung as Assyria, Egypt, and Asia Minor, thousands of miles away. There were stone workers, wood workers, brick makers, uh, relief makers, and we know that these were people often imported from all over the empire. Today, over 2,500 years later, crumbling ruins are the only remnants of what was once here, Persia's first shining capital city. Parsagad's showpiece was its two magnificent palaces surrounded by a majestic park and vast formal gardens. Among them, the first known appearance of the astonishing Paradisia, the four-quartered walled Persian gardens. The gardens had over 1,000 yards of channels of carved limestone, designed such that water would enter small basins every 16 yards. The Paradisia of Parsagad laid the foundations for many of the world's most magnificent gardens for the next two millennia. What's particularly different with the Paridesa is the application of the geometric design. So we have squares, rectangular designs, floral designs, cypress trees, wild grasses, roses, lilies, all kinds of vegetations. And this is the concept of the modern park as we know it. As Pasargad was being built, Cyrus added to his dominion, one enemy kingdom after another. But Cyrus was a very different kind of king. 
he refused to enslave his new subjects, a revolutionary concept in the ancient world. He recognized the local validity, if you will, of different religions and beliefs and uh, allowed those things to, to persist. In 539, Cyrus conquered Babylon, but he did not present himself as a conqueror. He presented himself as a liberator, rescuing these people from their despotic ruler. And then he did a totally unprecedented thing. He freed the Jews. The Jews had been living in Babylon in captivity ever since Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and their temple, and Cyrus freed them. Now, it could be said in hindsight or political history that Cyrus was looking for a buffer state between a hostile Egypt and his own empire. But so what? The point is, is that no one had ever done anything like this, and hardly anyone has ever done anything like it since. And subsequently, he is the only Gentile in the Bible to be referred to as Mashiach, or Messiah. As uh, one distinguished Oxford scholar once said to me, Cyrus always had a very good press. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very true uh, statement. Before he could launch the campaign that would make Persia the lone superpower of the ancient world, Cyrus the Great died in battle in 530 BC. He didn't live long enough to show what really he could have done outside the battlefield. So in that sense, you can compare him with Julius Caesar, who conquered, but did not live long enough, uh, he was assassinated, to put the empire that he conquered together. By the time Cyrus died, the Persian Empire had three capitals, Babylon, Susa, and Ekbatana. But he chose to be buried in the city he created, Pasargad in the tomb that mirrored the man who built it. At Cyrus's tomb, one of the aspects that shows his humility is that tomb is relatively unadorned, very simple, very elegant. Cyrus's engineers built the tomb in the form of simple but heavy stone Western structures. They began by laying large rectangular cut stones and used ramps, pulleys, and clamps to build the tomb to its height of 36 feet. The Tomb of Cyrus is a very simple, outwardly modest monument for somebody who uh, had created the largest empire that the world had seen to that date. And it's still remarkably well preserved after 25 centuries. For 30 years, no power on earth could stand up to Cyrus the Great. Now his throne was up for grabs, creating a power vacuum that would throw the ancient world into chaos. The word paradisia in Old Persian became paradise in ancient Greek. <laughs> 530 BC, Cyrus the Great, the architect of the greatest empire the world had ever known, is dead. For Persia, its future now hung in the balance. Rivals and pretenders to the throne vied for power. Then a distant cousin of Cyrus, a brilliant general, rose up to assume power. When the smoke cleared, the Persian Empire was securely in his grasp. His name was Darius. And he would become arguably the greatest Persian king and one of the greatest builders of all time. Darius hit the ground running. He began by rebuilding the old capital of Susa, with grand new palaces adorned in glazed brick. Today, the magnificence of the capital Susa is even found in the Bible. When the Greeks talk about Persian palaces, for example, they routinely mention Susa. When the Old Testament book of Esther uh, talks about Persian palaces, it's Susa that they mention. But the new king of Persia wanted a ceremonial capital all his own. 518 BC, Darius launched one of the most ambitious construction projects of the ancient world. Located near the modern city of Shiraz, it would become known as Persepolis, or Persian city in Greek. 
All of the palaces rose from a vast stone platform designed to enhance the stature of the empire. The Terrace Square is huge, over 125,000 square meters. And he had to modify the landscape. His engineers had to come in and level out part of the area, and they had to build a retaining wall. He wanted it to be seen from a distance. That's exactly why you build up a terrace, so it could be viewed from afar. That makes it all the more grand and imposing. Persepolis was a colossal engineering challenge, with walls more than 60 feet high and 35 feet thick, and great halls featuring intricately designed columns. Thousands of architects, craftsmen, and laborers, along with tons of materials, were brought from the far reaches of the empire. Most ancient empires were built by massive armies of slave labor, but Darius, like Cyrus, believed in paying for the work that built Persia's palaces and monuments. Every worker was given his due, his or her due, because we also find women in the workforce as well. Depending on their skill, what the quality they brought to the work, they were paid accordingly. No expense was spared. Persepolis would be the signature monument of Persian power and glory. First of all, it's important to remember the origin of the Persians themselves. That is to say that these were a nomadic people. They lived in tented accommodation, and they would up their tents, move somewhere else, and plant their tents again. Now, as time went on, these tents became more and more elaborate affairs. And essentially, what we're having at Persepolis is a tent turned into stone. The Apadana is nothing more than a stone tented building. The magnificent audience hall Darius built was called the Apadana. Each of those great monumental stone pillars are inspired by the kinds of wooden pillars that upheld a beautiful um, canvas roof. But now that canvas roof has turned to beautiful cedar wood instead. So the nomadic origins of the Persians gives um, the impetus to part of their architecture, but that's not all. The city's palaces were adorned in gold and silver, expensive tapestries, and colorful tiles. The walls were studded with carved reliefs of peaceful depictions of visiting dignitaries from conquered lands. But Persepolis' spectacular engineering achievements extended far beyond the city walls. Its intricately designed and constructed water and drainage system were unrivaled anywhere. Before the actual soil was placed in, first, Darius's engineers constructed a drainage system, plumbing, drain pipes. These would be covered. Water was also brought in along the Kanat system. But then those drain pipes, which would drain the effluents out, those were taken underground below the surface where the visitor would never see that. Even during his most ambitious projects to enhance the empire's monuments and infrastructure, Darius never stopped expanding his empire. Under the brilliant leadership of Darius, the Persian Empire grew to staggering size. It included modern Iran and Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan, Armenia, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, parts of Central Asia, all the way to northern India. And man, this is a lot of turf. To connect the farthest reaches of the empire, Darius would launch two audacious building projects. One would stretch over 1,500 miles of the Persian Empire. The other would connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Creating gardens was held in such high esteem that the Persian kings wished to be remembered as gardeners. Under the rule of Darius the Great, the Persian Empire grew to staggering proportions. Now he wanted to consolidate and connect the far-flung parts of his great kingdom. 515 BC, Darius orders his engineers to build a massive stone highway, one that would weave the empire together from North Africa to India. Extending over 1,500 miles of the empire, he would call it the Royal Road. 
This was quite the engineering feat because this had to traverse through mountains, forests, deserts. So typically, earth would be packed, hardened, for example. They may not have had, had uh, asphalt, but they certainly had knowledge of uh, packing gravel or tiny rocks. Laying down a stone road is vital in a terrain where there could be a high water table. You don't want to get your feet stuck in the mud. You don't want to get your cart stuck in the mud. So you have to raise the road surface up. That means laying down some kind of surface initially that will either absorb the groundwater or not allow the groundwater to uh, displace the road. The Royal Road was linked by 111 rest stations and inns every 18 miles, where travelers could eat, sleep, and switch to fresh horses. To ensure safety, watchmen were posted all along its great length. Now, I'm going to talk with my friend, Dr. Lloyd Llewellyn Jones from the University of Edinburgh, professor of ancient history. I got to ask you this. Was it that safe? Essentially, yeah. I think what uh, uh, Darius, or Darius, if you will, manages to do here is an incredible feat. I mean, we're standing here in Turkey, OK? Right. And we could take one route straight the way through into central Iran. I mean, that's pretty good going. How fast? OK, so if we're on horseback and uh, we're riding from one of these little garrisons to garrison every 15 miles, changing fresh horses, we can do that in about six, seven days, maybe. Six, six or days. seven days. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you could send messages on this road, mm -hmm. friends, yeah, next, most next city? most definitely. And, you know, and for trade, it, it's a godsend, as you can imagine. And this, this road cut through so much stuff. I mean, it just doesn't follow, you know, a, a formal pathway. It has to cross rivers, so it crosses the Tigris, it crosses by the ferry, River Hallis, right? by, by ferry, right. Uh, sometimes it clings to the side of mountains, sometimes it clings to the side of rivers. So the terrain is changeable. It's not drained or anything like that, so it's, it's not as advanced as some of the Roman roads we get right. later periods. So it doesn't have a gutter system? No, nothing like that, nothing like that. But what it's essentially is, it's sort of maybe 20 feet wide uh, with a sort of chip-in base, which is good for horse treads and sure. that kind of stuff, you know? And which carriages maybe, and Exactly, and to chariots. get things through as quickly as you can, basically. Well, Lloyd, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thank you for enlightening us about this incredible road. But Darius still wasn't through. There was one territory Darius had yet to firmly control the vast riches of North Africa, and he was determined to build a gateway there. He had his engineers devise a giant canal linking the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Everyone has heard of the Suez Canal, but how many have heard of Darius's canal? What Darius did was build an east-west canal that was 130 miles long. With the Persian knowledge of hydrology, Darius's engineers used digging tools made of bronze and iron to first open the canal, then clear any blown sand and line it with stone ready for his ships to sail. It would take seven years to complete the 130-mile-long waterway with a massive labor force of Egyptian stone cutters and canal builders. Parts of the canal between the Nile and the Red Sea were, were actually not waterways, but just points along which the, the ships could be dragged uh, until they reached uh, another deeper portion where they could again sail their course. Darius says, I, Darius, king of kings, conqueror of Egypt, built this canal. He connected the Red Sea to the Nile River for trade, and he says, and ships were brought along my canal. By 513 BC, Persia was the largest empire the world had ever seen, even exceeding the size and wealth of Rome at its height four centuries later. Persia was invincible, and its appetite for conquest was beginning to frighten an emerging power across the Mediterranean, the city-states of Greece. Just a little geographical info. That big body of water out there is the Black Sea. This thin body of water here is the Bosphorus Strait that connects the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. So I'm standing in Asia, or Asia Minor, if you will, and that land over there is Europe. Now, Darius put down a revolt from some cities on the coast of Turkey, but this revolt had been supported by Athens, so Darius wanted to teach Athens a lesson. He was gonna march on Greece and attack that city, but how is he gonna do it? He's got to go across the sea. 
Well, he takes a bridge of boats, pontoons, if you will, and lines them up from that point to that point and marches an army, so Herodotus says, of 70,000 men across the sea to attack Greece. Amazing. Persian engineers connected one side of the Bosporus to the other by scuttling boats side by side to form the foundation. Then they built a highway across the top, linking Asia to Europe. Probably this was a system of planks, and underneath there was a system of packed earth, or perhaps dry wood, to keep basically the road stable. Now, to keep the ships from wobbling, they must have used an anchor system of a certain weight, because if the anchor would have been too heavy, that would have, of course, tilted or damaged the ships. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but due to the choppy waters of the Bosphorus. That's quite the feat of engineering before the age of computers. It is late August in the year 490 BC. Darius has already marched into Greece and taken Macedonia. Now he's destined to meet the Greek general Themistocles and an army from Athens and Corinth at the famous Battle of Marathon. The massive army from Persia numbers 60,000 or 140,000, 250,000, depending upon the propaganda you read. Suffice it to say, the Greeks are outnumbered 10 to 1. Their only recourse is to send for reinforcements. So the legendary runner Philippides runs from Marathon to Sparta, a distance of 140 miles in two days, hence the name of the race, Marathon. The two armies faced each other separated by a vast open plain. If they clashed head on, the massive Persian forces would mow down the greatly outnumbered Greeks. This was the beginning of the Persian Wars. A reduced Greek force attacked the Persians head on. The Persians went for an easy kill. But the remaining Greek forces had split into two and opened two other fronts against the Persians. Sucked into a bloody slaughter pit, the Persians suffered heavy losses and retreated. For the Greeks, it was a great victory. For the Persians, just a speed bump on their path to world domination. Darius decided to return home and turn his attention to shoring up Persepolis, his capital city. He would never get there. In 486 BC, Darius died on his way to quelling a rebellion in Egypt, leaving behind an empire that redefined the very notions of power and glory. He also prevented a replay of the chaos that followed the death of Cyrus by naming his successor, his son Xerxes. Now Cyrus the innovator and Darius the expansionist were very hard acts to follow but Xerxes had been a king in waiting all of his life. And a couple of his first acts were to suppress a rebellion in Babylon, another one in Egypt. And then he went after the Greeks. Somehow the Greeks just stuck in his craw. Some historians argue that Xerxes was making a preemptive strike. Others say that he was just cleaning up the business of his father. Whatever the case, the Greeks were no longer intimidated or impressed by the Persians since they'd beaten them at Marathon. And so Xerxes buddied up with the Carthaginian navy and the tip of what is now modern Tunisia, and he decided to beat the Greeks at sea. Discovered in 1931, Persepolis is one of the last archaeological excavations that dates back to the ancient world. For 80 BC, the Persian Empire is at its peak, vast, immensely powerful, and incredibly rich. It's been 10 years since the Greeks defeated Darius the Great at the Battle of Marathon. His son Xerxes is now the latest absolute monarch in Persia's Achaemenid dynasty, and Xerxes wants revenge. Greece is only beginning to emerge as a force to be reckoned with, a coalition of profoundly different city-states, from democracies to dictatorships. They are united only by one creed, their hatred of Persia. The ancient world is on the verge of the Second Persian War. The outcome will lay the foundation for the modern world. 
Greeks uh, traditionally called everybody except themselves barbarians. So this whole thing really uh, between East and West started probably with the Persians and the Greeks and continued ever since. The Persian invasion of Greece would be one of the greatest collaborations of strategy and engineering in military history. The massive invasion would be a complex land-sea assault demanding some astonishing feats of engineering. Xerxes wanted his forces to enter Greece at the Isthmus of Mount Athos, but the seas there were so turbulent, the king directed his builders to dig a canal across the Isthmus. With vast manpower and expertise in canal engineering, Xerxes' engineers took a mere six months to complete the canal across the Isthmus. But the next challenge facing his generals and architects was even greater. The huge Persian army still had to cross the one and a half mile wide Hellespont. To this day, their solution is considered one of the most ambitious engineering projects ever conceived for a military campaign. Borrowing a page from his father's book, Xerxes ordered a double pontoon bridge built across the Hellespont. A feat of engineering that would far surpass the bridge Darius built at the Bosporus. But what's very interesting is that 674 ships were now lined up. How were these ships kept stable? This must have been quite an engineering feat. The Bosphorus is not a very calm area. It can be quite choppy. The row of ships were kept in place with a very taut system of cables, probably two large cables that ran between Asia and Europe. Now remember, a large number of troops crossed this bridge, perhaps up to 240,000 troops. The ropes allowed the boat sufficient flexibility of movement in the turbulent waters. Each section of the bridge was built on two boats connected by planks, so the entire roadway could ride the waves, absorbing much of the surface choppiness. Persian engineers then constructed a platform across the top of the boats, then the roadway on top of that. With each wood plank, a superhighway emerged, crossing the Hellespont using battleships as the foundation. Remember, we're dealing with the hooves of tens of thousands of cavalry, including armored cavalry, which would have been much, much heavier. The ships were amazingly kept stable, so this allowed Xerxes to cross with his army into Europe and cross back when he needed to, and the ships were kept in place. And for a short period, Europe and Asia were one. 10 days later, with his bridge complete, Xerxes marched into Europe. The whole army crossed with heavy equipment, heavy cavalry, and the planks were kept in place. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but due to the choppy waters of the Bosphorus. Xerxes' strategy was simple. Overwhelm the Greeks on land and at sea with superior numbers. Once again, the Greeks were led by the great general Themistocles. He knew he couldn't beat Xerxes on land, so the entire campaign was designed to lure the Persian navy into a trap. Unseen by the Persians, Themistocles left with most of his army, leaving only a token force of 6,000 Spartans behind. In August of 480 BC, the two armies met at a spot chosen by the Greeks, Thermopylae, a mountain pass so narrow only one chariot at a time could get through. For days, the massive Persian army was stalled, bottlenecked on the wrong side of the pass, just as the Greeks planned. Like his father before him, Xerxes was about to charge headlong into a Greek trap. When they finally broke through the narrow pass, the Persians easily destroyed the meager Spartan force Themistocles had left behind as bait and marched toward Athens. But when Xerxes reached the city, Athens was deserted. Xerxes suspected he had been duped and would make the Athenian people pay for it. For generations, tolerance for their vanquished had been the hallmark of Persian kings. 
not this time. In a very un-Persian-like act, Xerxes burnt Athens to the ground. The Persian king regretted it immediately, and the following morning ordered Athens rebuilt. But it was too late. The deed was done. His moment of rage would come back to haunt Persia nearly 200 years later. But this war was still far from over. At the same time, Themistocles was setting his trap that lured the massive Persian navy into the narrow bay at Salamis. Then he unleashed a surprise attack. The huge Persian fleet was caught in the naval equivalent of gridlock. They couldn't maneuver in the tiny bay, while the Greeks used their heavy triremes as battering rams to demolish the Persian ships. It was a decisive victory for the Greeks. Xerxes returned home defeated, king of a Persian empire that was no longer invincible. There is one high note in the Persian loss against the Greeks at the Battle of Salamis, one saving grace, a woman named Artemisia, the sole female Navy captain in the Persian fleet. She faked out the Greeks by ramming one of her own losing ships, and she sailed away to escape in the confusion. Her survival skills so impressed Xerxes that he was thought to have said, my men are becoming women, and my women are becoming men. The Persian Wars launched Athens into its golden age, but left the colossal Persian Empire vulnerable. It would be left to a young prince, a worshiper of Persia's great kings, to deal the empire its last blow. Humiliated by Artemisia's daring escape, the Greeks offered a huge price for her capture, but Artemisia had safely sailed home. BC, the Greeks had defeated the Persian fleet at Salamis. The aura of invincibility that surrounded this empire was gone. But there were still days of power and glory ahead for the Persian Empire. Fifteen years later, in 465 BC, the Persian king Xerxes died. Xerxes left the empire to his son, Artaxerxes who was determined to take Persia back to its golden days. He began by turning his attention to a building project begun by his grandfather, Darius. Four decades after it was started, Persepolis, the magnificent capital city, was still under construction. Now Artaxerxes would oversee one of the last great engineering projects of the Persian Empire. Today we know it as the remarkable Hall of a Hundred Columns, we know that the actual hall was some 200 by 200 feet, almost on the perfect square. And what's remarkable of the Persepolis columns is when you look up uh, the entire shaft, and these things raise, you know, hundreds of feet into, into the air, there is not one piece of displacement whatsoever. It's a perfect, perfect vertical. They're working with what we might consider to be primitive tools, just stone mallets and bronze chisels, that's all. The fluting on the columns of Persepolis is so precise, however, that these are clearly the work of master craftsmen. The columns are constructed in drums, seven or eight drums stacked on top of another. This is done by scaffolding the whole area around the column and then with a crane, a wooden crane, literally moving each column drum in place. Any client king, any governor from a distance, or even anyone who would come in that hall would be so impressed by the vastness of the hall and by this forest of columns that stretched nearly as far as the eye could see. An amazing achievement. Across the empire, Persians were still producing some of the most extraordinary feats of engineering in the ancient world. In 353 BC, the wife of a local governor began work on a magnificent tomb for her dying husband. Her tribute to him would be a marvel of engineering and would become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Mausoleum of Masulus. The marble monument would rise to 135 feet tall, enclosing a great courtyard. 
The roof was a pyramid with a staircase on each side, a pathway to heaven. More than 2,500 years later, the tomb of U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant in New York City would be designed after the mausoleum of Masulus. By the fourth century BC, Persian engineering was still the finest in the world. But underneath the soaring columns and shining palaces, the empire's very foundations were crumbling. And its enemies were soon at the gate. When Athens supports a rebellion in Egypt and Greeks occupy the capital city of Memphis, Artaxerxes leaves Persepolis and his building projects, and he launches a military campaign to kick the Greeks out of Memphis and bring Egypt back under Persian control once again. It'll be the last great victory of the Persian Empire, because in 424 BC, Artaxerxes dies, leaving a power vacuum and eight solid decades of rampant infighting and neglect. And while the Persian Empire is embroiled in internal conflict and corruption, a young Macedonian prince is studying Herodotus and the accounts of the great Persian hero, Cyrus the Great. And this Macedonian prince will set his eyes on conquering the world. His name is Alexander. In 336 BC, a distant relative of Artaxerxes rose to power. He took a regal name Darius III. He will always be remembered as the king who lost an empire. Over the next four years, Alexander and Darius III met head to head in a series of fierce battles as Darius III's army was slowly pushed back to its own doorstep. In 330 BC, Alexander was at the gates of the empire's crown jewel, the capital city of Persepolis. Alexander adopted the Persian policy of respecting the defeated. None of his soldiers were allowed to pillage or plunder the lands they had conquered. But how do you tame so many soldiers after a victory over the most magnificent empire on planet E? Well, maybe his soldiers were restless or resentful, or maybe they just remembered the stories of how Athens had been burned by the Persians. In any case, at Persepolis, they let go. Huge celebrations took place after the victory, and during these celebrations, the treasury was pillaged. And then one of the saddest acts of arson in all of history took place. Persepolis was burned. Alexander uh, was not in the uh, business of destroying things. Persepolis probably was burned because it was a symbolic thing. And he also burned it uh, to make a symbolic gesture, not a destructive uh, gesture. There must have been wonderful draperies and things around, and no doubt fire could have begun accidentally just as much as purposefully, because if he really wanted to be an Achaemenid king, the last thing he should want to do was to destroy Persepolis. But there were no fire engines, and once the blaze had taken hold, it, it was a very terrible blaze, and it, it, it left its mark throughout the site. Darius III had escaped capture, but in the summer of 330 BC, he was murdered by a close ally. The last Achaemenid king was dead. Alexander gave Darius III a magnificent funeral and later even married his daughter. Alexander declared himself an Achaemenid Persian king and added the final chapter to the story of an empire that had spanned three continents and endured for over 2,700 years. Alexander, admirer of Persian kings, chased down the murderers of Darius and killed them himself. Alexander believed that only kings had the right to kill kings. But would have Alexander actually killed Darius? Probably not, because Alexander didn't create an empire. He only conquered one. The empire already existed, created by Cyrus the Great. No, Alexander's genius was to co-opt and use Persia, an empire that stood long before Alexander was born and whose legacy of culture and sophistication and luxury would be around long after Alexander was dead. For the History Channel, I'm Peter Weller.